Recording in progress. Welcome back. Now we move into paper presentations. The theme this morning is applications of IT. So I would like to welcome the chairperson of the morning session, Dr. Tushani Virasinghe. Dr. Tushani Alvis Virasinghe is a senior lecturer at the University of Colombo School of Computing. Currently, she is the coordinator of the e-learning center at UCSC. She obtained her PhD from the Department of Computer and System Sciences from Stockholm University, Sweden in 2015. She has a special interest on designing online learning environments for distance learning programs and conducting research in technology enhanced learning environments. She has authored or co-authored more than 30 research publications and coordinated several national and international projects on e-learning. With that, I'd like to hand over the control of the morning session to Dr. Tushani Virasinghe. Thank you. Good morning, and I will warmly welcome all of you, the audience and the presenters. And today uh, we have one presenter presenting the paper physically. The, all the other presenters are presenting the papers online. So altogether we have seven presentations. I will uh, invite the first presenter. Uh, She's presenting the paper online, Ms. Hirasha Puliyadda, and all together with her, there are two other, two others, uh, Diniti Kurukura Sivuriya and Charini Piris. Hirasha Puliyadda is, a, is an undergraduate, uh, graduate of the Information Systems degree program at UCSC, and she was also a former assistant lecturer at the UCSC. The next one, uh, Diniti Kurukura Surya is a graduate of information systems degree program at UCSC, and she is currently working as a senior product specialist at IFS uh, Research and Development International Private Limited. Uh, the third one, Charini Piris is a graduate of information systems degree program at the UCSC, and she is currently working as a senior software quality assurance engineer at Cisco Labs, Sri Lanka. So I invite uh, our organizing committee to play the recorded video. Hello, everyone. We are going to present our research titled Towards Improving Early Learning Capabilities of Students Through a Gamified Learning Tool. I'm Diniti Kurukula Surya, and my co-authors are Hirasha Puliyadda, Sharini Piris, Dr. Inosha Hetiarachi, and Professor K.P. Heva Gamake. So what is the problem that we tried to address? Due to the problems like pandemic situations, economic crises, and full crises that we came across in the recent past, every citizen across the country is struggling to carry out their day-to-day -day activities by adjusting to the new normal. Then what about the kids who just started schooling? They too find it difficult to continue their education. Many schools have started adapting online methods of learning, and during the preliminary study, we observed that when there is a distance learning requirement for students, especially grade one and two students, they carry out their work via social media platforms like WhatsApp and Zoom. However, the parents were of the op opinion that this is not a 100% effective method of learning. We explored how gamification can be applied to address these timely issues by implementing a web-based gamified learning application called Punchi Nanisala. Before moving on, let me give you a brief definition of the term gamification. According to Elphetheria et al., 
Gamification is the use of game elements, mechanics, and dynamics in a non-game context in order to engage and motivate users. We conducted a literature survey in these four areas, gamification in education, existing educational gaming tools in the Sri Lankan and international context, and evaluation methods. While conducting the literature survey, we came across several studies which have used gaming elements such as leaderboards, towers, and coins in their applications and have proved to engage and motivate users in a massive way. Therefore, we have adapted these elements in our application as well. While referring to some studies conducted to evaluate user behavior remotely, we came across a few that have tracked emotions, mouse click monitoring, and gathered user feedback remotely. But no research has been conducted combining all of these mechanisms together. However, the Punchinanasal application was developed in a manner to track all those listed here. So accordingly, we identified the research gap, which the other researchers couldn't or failed to address, which is a solution in Sri Lanka, for students in Key Stage 1, which is students in Grade 1 and 2, to learn amidst a global pandemic and promote distance learning. So after identifying the research gap and the problem, we set our motivation for our research to overcome the drawbacks of the current educational system of Sri Lanka for Key Stage 1 students, while also providing a feasible solution through gamification that will act as a learning tool during a social distancing situation in order to improve the skills of students in the subject aspects of mathematics, singular language, and environmental studies. Now I'll present the research questions that we've formulated. Our main research question is to find out one if, what impact does gamification of early learning capabilities have on children during a situation of social distancing to improve their performance. The other two sub-research questions focus on how does the performance of children improve in terms of these three areas, mathematical, singular language, and environmental studies, and how effective the remote data evaluation will be during the pandemic situation? So now I will discuss the research methodology. Our research follows the design science research, research methodology, which includes six stages. The six stages are problem identification, defining the solution, design and development, implementation, evaluation, and communication. In the problem identification stage for preliminary data gathering purposes, questionnaires were given to a set of doctors, parents, and teachers while also conducting interviews with them. Additionally, we referred to the National Institute of Education and Teachers Guide to study the educational content of Key Stage 1. This is the research design we adopted to conduct our experiment. 60 participants were recruited using convenience and snowball slumping methods, and they were randomly assigned to the two sample groups as experimental and control groups. A pretest was given for both Kunchin and Asala Gamified Learning Treatment was given to the experimental group of students as an additional learning tool. During the experiment, students were evaluated using emotions, ideal time, and performance. The control groups were assumed as following only the online learning methods during this period. After the experiment, a post test was given again to the both sample groups to detect the improvement of the two groups. These are some snapshots from our web-based gamified application, Fujin and Salo. The gamified learning tool was given to grade one and two students with two different difficulty levels, which cover the three subjects. The application was a web-based gaming application, which was also mobile responsive. We remotely evaluated students' performance using emotion tracking, mouse click monitoring, performance analysis, and pre-test pre versus post-test results. We also assessed student progress and reported it to the parents via email. The tool also consisted of a multi-mode authentication method, which consists of both password authentication and facial recognition. The results of the research are outlined in this section. Data were analyzed and results were obtained for each research question formulated. The main research question was analyzed using both qualitative and quantitative evaluation techniques. Through the performance analysis, we wanted to find how the learning time spent within the application by experimental group students affected their performance in terms of marks obtained and time spent on the post-test compared to the control group. The table here depicts the average time taken and the marks obtained by the sample groups to complete the pre-test and post-test, along with the average gamified learning time spent by the experimental group students. 
Compared to the control group, we could observe that the experimental group experienced a larger reduction in time spent and a larger improvement in the marks obtained due to the receiving of the gamified treatment. In the interviews conducted with the students, they mentioned that they liked the Kunjinansala application due to the effectiveness of the video-based learning methodology, gaming elements, presentation of useful content, and the game-like approach. Parents gave us positive feedback regarding the application, and they mentioned that student engagement towards learning improved, the application helped them to assess their children, and that the application helped their kids to build their vocabulary and ability to follow instruction. The satisfaction survey given to experimental group of students consisted of three MCQ questions and a Likert scale. These are some responses we received. The feedback questionnaire given to parents and teachers consisted of MCQ and a Likert scale question. Questions were asked regarding the gaming elements, learning videos, content, and about overall opinion regarding the application. All the responses were received as excellent and very good, and almost all agreed on the fact that a gamified application should be introduced to schools. The second sub-research question, how will the performance of children improve in terms of the three subjects using quantitative te techniques, the student's test, emotion analysis, and ID time analysis? This table shows the performance of the two sample groups in the pre-test and the post-test. How to verify these improvements statistically, a T-student analysis was performed and the table here, the positive results we got. The first sub-research question was also evaluated using an emotion analysis with Pearson correlation and regression analysis. The purpose was to analyze how the game score affects the attitudinal behavior of the participants through emotional dis emotions displayed while engaging in the application. For this, we considered happiness and surprise as positive emotions. Since all the correlations were recorded as positive, we were able to conclude that when a student scored higher marks within the application, the positive emotion displayed increased. To further prove the, prove the formulated correlations, a simple linear regression analysis was performed. All the regression lines graphically represented an upward slope. The third evaluation technique used for the research question that focused on how the performance of students improved in terms of the three areas was idle time analysis by using Pearson correlation. The purpose of this analysis was to analyze the time interval between mouse clicks and correlating with the game score to understand how the performance of the students were affected by the time spent idly in the application. The idle time was considered as the maximum time interval between two mouse clicks. According to the result presented here, mathematical and symbolic games and the overall application recorded a negative correlation. The final research question was evaluated using qualitative techniques and mixed mode methods. To answer this sub-research question, observational studies, interviews, and satisfaction surveys were conducted. And we derived that these were effective in terms of recording and storing data. We observed that students were deeply engaged, comfortable, not stressed, and had no objection to participate. During the preliminary study, parents gave their consent to record their students' emotions through the questionnaires. And during the feedback interviews, they mentioned that such remote evaluation mechanisms can be used to evaluate online examinations. Now we are going to present the conclusions we derived through the study. We were able to conclude that the experimental group had a positive impact on their performance in terms of marks and in time. This was further proved using the chief student analysis we performed. Teachers commented on the features, usability, child friendliness, curriculum or directors of the application as deriving teachers to improve the student performance. Parents believed that the gunfight application served as a lifesaver tool. The emotion analysis conducted revealed how this, this increase in game score result in positive emotional state and through the idle time analysis. We identified that the students who idle the least within the application score higher marks. We also assessed how 
the gamified learning tool will effectively assist the remote performance evolution process during a pandemic situation or distance learning situation. With the help of questionnaires, interviews, and observational studies, we were able to verify that the remote performance evaluation techniques were accurate, effective, and reliable. As for the future work, most of the parents and teachers suggested that promoting the Punji Nanasal tool as an additional learning tool in the school. Additional features could be added to the tools such as more difficulty levels, modules, and gaming elements. Further, this concept can be used for additional context slides uh, in universities for the other key stages and for the students with special needs. Moreover, remote evaluation mechanisms, including eye tracking and keystroke monitoring, can be also included. These are some of the, some of the materials we referred to. Thank you. Glad to know about your good work, Hirasha, Diniti, and Charini. Are you online? Yes, madam. Audience, uh, it's time for question and answer. Do you have any questions? Okay, uh, let me ask a question. Uh, and now, Sharini, uh, Hirasha, and uh, Diniti, uh, uh, did you consider about the prior learning experience of the students? Before giving this uh, tool, uh, you should have considered the prior learning experience. And also, when you are evaluating this tool, uh, I believe that we have to consider the prior learning experience of the students and their, uh, their capability of using the technology. Yes, so uh, we conducted a pretest uh, uh, for all the like control group and the experimental group to evaluate their like current uh, learning capabilities. And apart from that, uh, regarding the technological capabilities, uh, most of them were not actually familiar, but through the gaming application, we actually observed that uh, they had some improvement with regards to using technological tools as well. Okay, did you consider their capabilities when you're grouping the students? Grouping the students as in, madam, is not- uh, You had two groups. Yeah. Experimental group and the control group. Yes, madam, we assessed their capabilities and we assume that all of them have the, has the uh, required knowledge using the devices and when using uh, the required devices in order to use this tool. And even when uh, developing the tool, we uh, only, like we didn't uh, include any advanced uh, technologies uh, so that they, it will be hard for them to use. It was mainly uh, mouse clicks. So they'll just have to navigate through the application and just answer the questions through mouse clicks. Okay, one more question. Um, how did you analyze the emotions? You have considered the emotions of the students as well. So my question is about how did you analyze the emotions of the students uh, after capturing the videos, the video recordings? Uh, we can't hear you, Charini, you are muted. Okay, so for that, we use Face API to gather the emotions of the students. So itself, we get like uh, positive emotions and the negative emotions as well. So as the positive emotions, we got happiness and surprise. So uh, uh, Face API give us a percentage of that. So based on that, we did the analysis. Okay, thank you. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Okay, if you have any questions, please uh, post to Slido.com. Uh, presenters, uh, please uh, try to answer the questions uh, in Slido. Please check that. We'll move to the next presentation. Before that, yes, please, uh, we'll clap hand for Hirasha, Diniti, and Charini for their very good presentation. The next presentation is uh, on paper ID 33, the title, an augmented reality-based fashion design interface with artistic content generated using deep generative models. The presenter is Chamodi Jayatilaka. She is a 
recent graduate student at the University of Colombo School of Computing, who completed her degree in Bachelor of Science Honors in Information Systems. She's presenting her paper physically. Yes, I'm inviting you. Yes. Uh, hi, good morning, all of you. Uh, today, I'm going to present the research presentation of the an augmented reality based fashion design interface with artistic content generated using deep generative models. I am Chamodi Jayatilaka. Here are the, my research partners of this research. So, uh, here you can see the today's roadmap of our research presentation. And let's move to the introduction and motivation. So, we know that uh, close are essential needs of the human beings. So, with the time, Present past to present the patterns and style change in the clothes, but the beauty of the cloth remains constant. So when we think about the fashion designing, always design design their design concept uh, into visible content such as sketch. For that, they require significant amount of time, effort, and expertise. But with the recent advancement of technologies, tools like Valentina tool for pattern drafting, cloth 3D for uh, generating. Uh, fashion images and visualized through the computer model, artificial intelligence, augmented reality, significant changes occurs in the fashion industry. Uh, when we talking about the research areas in the fashion in industry, mainly depends on these deep generative models area and augmented reality. Deep generative models are gain attention when generating artistic content and augmented reality help for the visualization method for fashion where real and virtual world are registered in 3D for real interaction. The key limitation behind these two areas is when we use the deep generative models for fashion design, it only focuses on generating new content and it does not provide a mechanism to visualize the generate cloth by providing features in virtual try on clothes in human by using augmented reality. So our approach is an augmented reality interface for fashion design with artistic content generating using deep generative models. Uh, now let's move to the literature review. In 2014, Godfellow and his colleagues introduced this generative adversary network. In there, there are two networks as generator and discriminator. In generator, it creates a random noise input, and in discriminator, it classifies the outputs as real and fake. Uh, in 2014, uh, Misa Osendra developed this concept to condition a generator adversary by adding a proposed model condition on both networks, generator and discriminator. And in 2019, introduced new architecture called classifier that help for the generate content more details using classifier. And from that, it can map the features into corresponding classes. When we're talking about the image synthesis of deep generative model, always we need to understand the common features and unique features between two visual representation. And in image synthesis, it always preserve the natural image and only transfer the style transfer. So in image synthesis, uh, the, this is the reason literature that is the texture again, it control the deep image synthesis for texture patches, and it only done for the shoes and handbags. Uh, in 2019, uh, this image texture again is developed and introduced the guided to pix to pix model built upon pix to pix architecture, but this me method is also transfer the features in textures and poses, but it also tested the handbags and shoes. Uh, in talking about the virtual try on system, an image-based virtual try-on network is introduced in 2018 called Viton. It transformed the dress into the personal respective region on the body using the cost to find strategy overlays in a cloth image to given person image. This is a indicate that 2D image synthesis is only done. And in 2020, a blessed pose method that tracking the on real-time body pose tracking and produce the three, 33 body key point in a single person. So in this method, in this literature review, we identify a research gap that deep generative models have not yet been explored in generating fashion content for the designer's conceptual idea and the existing applications are limited to generate clothing images and do not provide mechanisms to visualize 
the generated cloth on the human body. A combined solution for synthesized fashion from sketches and themes and visualizing real time with augmented reality is here for the fashion industry in fashion decision making. So our proposed approach is combined solution of augmented reality and deep generative models that help for the fashion designers in decision making when they giving us sketches and themes and produce the generated output and finally this generated output will be virtually real time can be visualized by them in real time so here you can see the comparison between the past literature works and our work in here our work is help for the decision support system for the designer and we inputted the uh, user sketches and themes and from that we generate the output and finally this output is virtual trying for that, uh, we get the 5,000 of cloth fashion data set, mainly the dressers, and evaluating using FID scores, inception scores, human factor study. So next, let's move to the research methodology. So we our approach is to constructive research approach, and we follow this seven step. In our research design, we inputted the theme image and the sketch image to generate the adversary network and generate the synthetic image. And finally, the synthetic image is virtual try on on a human body in real time. So for that, uh, we use this GAN component, mainly the texture GAN. Uh, the previous texture GAN and our GAN is, well, is uh, different because we improve this texture GAN because uh, in this GAN, we can move the texture patches to different places. So in here, we get the generate synthetic fashion image by controlling the textures and colors of the input theme image when we given the sketch and theme. In the virtual try-on, we extract the body coordinates of X and Y, and we point eight points of the human to eight points of the cloth, and we map this 2D cloth image to extract the body coordinates by identifying the video frame and surface and estimate the home graph and apply this transformation mapping cloth. Here you can see how we map the cloth image to the human being. And here you can see what are the eight points that will be used to map our cloth image to the human body. From that, we can help the human when we move, the cloth also move. Uh, and to evaluate our system, we design a prototype. In there, there are two user interfaces, one for ARGAN user interface and virtual try on user interfaces. For ARGAN user interface, we generate a synthesis fashion content. Their input is a sketch and theme. For the virtual try on interfaces, the output is a virtual try on fashion design. In webcam or video of the virtual trainer, in there we input a generated 2D fashion image. So here you can see the user interface of the AR GAN. And uh, here you can see the user interfaces of the virtual trion. Here, when we inputted the generated uh, image in gener uh, generated image to this virtual trion user interface, after that we have to map those eight points relevant to this cloth image. From that, we can map this cloth image to the uh, real human being in real time. So here you can see in the uh, left side, the real time, how we map the cloth into the uh, human. And this is the model video that will map the cloth into the human. Uh, next, let's move the results and evaluation. So here you can see the generated results that we gained from our GAN. And uh, here you can see how the virtual try on results work in the system. Uh, and in evaluation, we evaluation mainly focuses on generative model. In there, we will use the machine learning matrices for the quality and to evaluate the quality of generative fashion design on designer's perspective. We going through a user study, and we to evaluate the virtual try on, uh, we evaluate through a survey and a user study. Uh, here you can see the GAN model evaluation. For that, we use uh, this FID scores and inception score uh, as a baseline method. Method we use guided to pixel pixel and we compare our AR GAN method with them. From that, we can see from results the quality images we generated from AR GAN. Other than that, uh, we use the user study, we get the 25 participants and uh, compare these two uh, results. From that, the, we get these results. Other than that, we done a pilot study and main study to fashion generation how the they think the fashion designers, how the fashion generation when given theme and the virtual try on. So in the pilot stu study, uh, we get the results. What are the satisfactory level of the level of the, these generated fashion images and virtual try on? Positive feedback, negative feedback, suggestion to proof of concept prototype. 
So in there, in quantitative reserve, we given twelve questions with the answers with Likert scale, and uh, in here you can see how the results are ranged from participants who rate to six to nine in the ten point Likert scale. And in the pilot study in qualitative reserve, we gain positive and feedback, negative feedback and suggestions that will be helpful to improve our prototype and increase the number of coordinates that map the dress into human body and uh, to add a standard model video to virtual trial. After the done the pilot study, we do the main study. In there, we use 25 subjects and uh, they also come in from the fashion domain from University of Moratua. In there, we will give pre-questionaries and questionaries in uh, 14 questions. In there also, we get the results as a percentage of who rate 6 to 9, 10 point Likert scale. And in there also, we get positive feedbacks, uh, negative feedbacks and improvements suggest for our prototype and how they evaluate their virtual try-on component and generate a fashion image. Other than that, how the we given five scenarios of results to the general public and uh, give their satisfaction and unsatisfaction to generate cloth and virtual try-on component. Here you can see how they evaluate the these results. And uh, now let's move to conclusion and future work. In conclusion, the research present a novel proof of concept prototype to generate a new fashion design using a given theme and sketch and visualize the generated to this design in real time. This help for the fashion designers in decision making. Other than that, in future work, we can extend this prototype not only for the fashion in dresses of girls, no, kids and men's. And when we increase the number of data, we can get the quality images. Other than that, to improve the virtual try-on system, we can get the wide range of movements by point and different in 33 body form. Other than that, not limited to textures and colors of the given theme, we can develop this concept to get in the shape also. So here are the references I used in this presentation. Thank you for listening. Any questions? Thank you, Chamodi. It's a wonderful uh, presentation. Uh, do you have any questions, audience? Okay. Um, let me ask some questions. Uh, now, uh, I'm just a little bit curious about uh, what you have done because uh, and now you have referred to uh, some research work already conducted in 2022. Um, there, uh, I think you can remember Basare with et al. He, they have proposed a solution using Blaze Post neural network. And they have referred to, uh, they have found 33 body key points. And in your study, you have uh, identified or used uh, media pipe and it considered uh, 30, uh, sorry, eight, eight uh, yes. points, coordinates. So I just want to know whether you considered those eight based on those already identified 33? Yes, already identified uh, from 33, already identified eight is used because we want to map the 2D images to the human body. And actually we get the dresses of the long dresses. So if we map into the human body, we only take left shoulder, right shoulder, left hip and right hip and left knee and right hip. So those eight points are considered uh, to the, as we get the long dresses, as we collect the data set as a long dress data set. Okay, does it mean that uh, while reducing the number of key points, the quality of the uh, output would be reduced? The movement will be reduced because we only, uh, when we map to the cloth, when we move right and left, the cloth is move with us. When we go front and backward also, the cloth will be moved. But when we rotate, it's not move because it is a 2D image also. And we only map to eight points now. So it is not working. So if we, we can improve by mapping other points also, we can get uh, better movements with the uh, map. So image. how did you select this eight out of 33? Uh, we will select as the long rest, we select only, firstly, we select only six points. But Randomly? not randomly as it is a long dress. We know mm -hmm. that how we dress the wrong dresses. We get the shoulder as our, at the top of our dress. Mm -hmm. So it, when, the, when the given to the fashion designer, fashion designer will be uh, pointer. What are the points? Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay, thank you. Uh, so 
Do you have anything to ask? It's an interesting work. Yes, clap hands for her. Very nice presentation. So let's move to the next presentation. That's another online presentation. The paper ID 83. The title is Scientification of Road Surface Anomalies Using Crowdsourced Smartphone Sensor Data. The presenter is Yogya Gamage. She is an undergraduate at the Department of Computer Science and Engineering, University of Maratu, Sri Lanka. So I invite the coordinating organizing committee to play the pre-recorded video. Hi, you all. Uh, the topic of our research is identification of road surface anomalies using crowdsource, crowdsource smartphone sensor data. Uh, this is our team. Uh, so first, let's look at the introduction. Uh, for a sustainable development of a country, it is essential that the road network is properly maintained. Uh, poor road conditions can result in many negative effects, uh, such as additional costs and additional ride time. Uh, traditional methods of road quality monitoring are expensive and labor intensive, which makes it difficult for a developing country like Sri Lanka to regularly monitor the roads. Uh, previous research has revealed that uh, smartphones can be used to monitor road quality as a low cost solution. Uh, these are some related works uh, for road dog detection. Uh, here we have identified the major limitations of uh, not considering the effects of vehicle speed and other characteristics in identifying anomalies and depending on your site post to adjust the identification. Uh, next, we will look at our methodology and design. Uh, we carried out field tests to examine the ECDF acceleration signals under different road anomalies. And we identified that uh, we can clearly observe a deviation when a road anomaly occurs. Uh, when collecting data uh, by crowdsourcing, the collected signals can contain a variety of nonsense. Uh, therefore, after collecting acceleration signals from smartphone sensors, we have to pre-process them by applying noise removal filters. Uh, we selected the butter with a low pass filter because it is successful in removing noises in the low range. Uh, we also use uh, reorientation techniques uh, to reorient the smartphone along with uh, journey detection and uh, speed calculation methods. Uh, this table shows different types of road anomalies and the observed, de observed deviations. We also identified that uh, there is an effect on the observed acceleration signal by the vehicle speed. Uh, this graph shows the acceleration signals under three different speeds. Uh, so at a higher vehicle speed, uh, there is the possibility of a false spike occurring without an actual anomaly. And at a lower speed, uh, there is the possibility of a, uh, that, that a, a small spike can also be a result of an anomaly. As, uh, as the observed signal can vary based on the vehicle characteristics as well, rather than simply considering the spikes exceeding a threshold value as anomalies, we calculated the median absolute deviation value to determine the overall deviation. Uh, and because it is not possible to come up with a mathematical equation to obtain the relationship between vehicle speed, observed deviation, and the anomaly thresholds, we, uh, with the limited availability of data, we implemented a fuzzy logic uh, system to identify anomalous events. Uh, we decided to use fuzzy logic system because uh, according to previous literature, fuzzy logic enables reasoning and uh, making rational decisions in an environment of incomplete or uncertain information. Uh, we use vehicle speed and the median absolute deviation as the input to the uh, developed facility system. Uh, these are the input and output membership functions and rule decision interface of the system. Uh, if the output is greater than four, it is considered as an anomaly and sent for the classification process. Uh, this is the overall classification uh, diagram. 
uh, we are classifying the anomalies on the CVRT level as well so that uh, the, rele the relevant authorities can take necessary steps uh, ba based on the urgency. Uh, for this classification task, we experimented with six uh, different machine learning models, uh, random forest, XG boost, CAT boost, KNN, SVM, and logistic regression. Uh, we selected the output of the FASI system, the difference between the maximum and uh, minimum z axis acceleration, mean, standard deviation, root mean square, a definite integral, and a maximum first derivative, a spectral bandwidth, spectral flatness, and a spectral roll off uh, of the z axis acceleration as the input features to the models. After that, we develop a dashboard that visualizes the anomalies of roads in Sri Lanka on a map. This dashboard can be used by the relevant authorities and the public community to easily identify road conditions. We are using the microservices architecture to deploy the system. A microservices architecture helps to create a robust, flexible, and independent services. Uh, they can be run in parallel, which makes, makes it easy to maintain or scale the system. Uh, next, uh, we will look at the implemented system. The implemented system has two main parts. The first part is the iRoad6 mobile application, and the next part is the virtual dashboard. The first part of the solution is the iRoad6 mobile application. Uh, this will be used to collect crowdsource data from the general public. The virtual map dashboard visualizes the identified uh, potholes and bumps uh, on a virtual map of Sri Lankan roads. This is our overall system architecture. And next, we will look at the experiments and the results. To validate our proposed solution to identify and classify road anomalies, we created a data set consisting of the data collected by our field test and also a data set collected in previous research funded by Google Research. And that data set contained uh, all the necessary road sensor data to apply our same proposed methods and also contained all the metadata, including the smartphone types and vehicle types used. Uh, therefore, we could successfully use that data set in our study. Uh, using this data set helped to overcome the problem of limited availability of data and uh, provided us the opportunity to validate our solution in different contexts. Uh, so the combined data set included, included 300 bumps and uh, 715 photos. Uh, these are the achieved results for each of the machine learning models we experimented with. Next, we will discuss the limitations and future work of the project. One of the main limitations in our system is the limitations related to smartphone GPS errors. As we use GPS for vehicle speed calculation and visualizing anomalies as, and uh, segments in the map, uh, GPS accuracy is very important in our system, uh, but smartphones have an average GPS error of 10 meters, which is significant, especially in identifying anomalies. Uh, recent research has proposed methods to improve the GPS accuracy. And in future works, uh, it is possible to experiment using these techniques in our application to improve the GPS accuracy. Another main limitation uh, for achieving better accuracy is the limited availabil availability of accurately labeled data. A more complex or ensemble model can be experimented with uh, when more data is available. Uh, gyroscope um, signals can also be used to analyze road anomalies. Uh, the previous research suggests that uh, when data collected from gyroscope is also used, better accuracy can be achieved. Uh, the reason for not employing gyroscope data in this study, uh, in our study, uh, is that uh, gyroscopes are not available on some smartphone models, especially in older models. Uh, however, it is possible to uh, dynamically alter the prediction process and uh, use gyroscope data if available for better predictions. Uh, there are several other uh, possible uh, future research directions, such as predicting final levels of final level attributes of anomalies and uh, adding more features to the dashboard for passengers. 
Uh, these are the references we refer to. Uh, this is the end of our presentation. Uh, feel free to uh, raise any questions or suggestions you may have. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Ogya. It's, uh, it seems like a very good uh, research that would be very useful for the country as well. Uh, uh, actually, did you conduct it by with the motivation coming from the country? Uh, well, was there a uh, request from the country, the government uh, of Sri Lanka? Uh, yes. Sir. Hello. Uh, hello. Hello. Um, hi, Yogya. Uh, hi. Uh, uh, yeah, so about your question. Uh, yeah, so we actually uh, conducted meetings with the Road Development Authority and uh, yeah, so they also like uh, requested uh, different kinds of features on it. Uh, yeah, so it was actually uh, because of the situation of the country and all that. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yes, uh, audience. Any questions? The motivator, her good work. Okay, uh, there was one concern uh, regarding your uh, selection. Uh, you have mentioned that uh, you have used the cutoff frequency of three hertz with the fifth order butterworth filter. Can you remember? Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, okay. Uh, so, any justification of selecting that um, three hertz? Uh, as the uh, adequate level of frequency cutoff? Uh, yeah, so the reason was like, we actually first like um, reviewed uh, some of the previous uh, literature, like uh, what are the frequencies that uh, they have used. So there, there were some uh, uh, work uh, who actually used fuzzy logic in like, uh, also in different contexts. And also there were some work who have used fuzzy logic in this work in, in, in this uh, area as well, but uh, like their inputs and uh, like um, their structure was different, but we, uh, we reviewed them and uh, like uh, we selected what are the like what are the values that they have selected and then we like we selected a scope of values that uh, we should try in our experiment and then uh, with our uh, data we like we experimented with different kinds of cutoffs and that that was the uh, like the, uh, the base value that uh, suited our experiment oh i see so in the real scenario what would happen then so uh, in the real scenario now <clears throat> when we get the frequency so how do we decide uh, which one we should go for? Uh, so like at the moment, like uh, we are also using pre-processing techniques. So like uh, after pre-processing, uh, like all the signals, all the data that we collect will be cut off on that frequency. So we uh, uh, like at the moment, we don't use any adaptive uh, threshold to do that. Okay, so then this will not be a real-time analysis, no? Uh, no, not a real-time. So it's like it has to be processed before uh, they are showing in the map. Okay, okay. Okay, thank you. Um, yes, and again, uh, I think you we have to confirm that the phone is kept still. Uh, uh, otherwise, there will be a problem, no? Uh, not really. So in our pre-processing techniques, uh, we are using reorientation techniques. So that means you can uh, like keep the phone in any uh, removal uh, after removing the noises. So it can remove to a, to a certain extent, it can remove uh, some noises, but yes, uh, like in like, uh, if the phone is like dropped in like a, like if there is like a very, uh, like a very a large anomaly, then that can actually um, uh, change the uh, final result. But uh, like uh, what we are expecting is that because because we are using uh, we, we are uh, crowdsourcing, so there will be a lot of data collected. So that means like uh, when we are uh, uh, like using all the data to uh, get the final result, those uh, anomalous results will be removed. So that is our expectation. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, Yogya. Let's clap hand for her. We'll move to the next presentation. That's uh, paper ID 92. Uh, the title is Automated Vehicle Insur Insurance Claiming, uh, Automated Vehicle Insurance Claims Processing Using 
computer vision, natural language processing. So there are three presenters as we have received the names. Vitya, uh, Vitya Shagar and then uh, Radesh and Veer Siri Hevage. So there are three presenters. Uh, they are presenting online. Vitya Shagar uh, Tyaganathan is an undergraduate student learning data science specialization in BSc Honours Information Technology at the Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology, Malabe. His research interests include machine learning and deep learning, computer vision, artificial intelligence, and optical character recognition. The second presenter, Rajesh Hillary, is a final year undergraduate at the Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology, Malabe, Sri Lanka following a BSc in information technology specializing in data science. He is currently employed as an associate engineer at um, Arimak Lanka, sorry, Arimak Lanka, Sri Lanka. His uh, research interests are in the field of machine learning, artificial intelligence, data science, and data engineering. The last one, the Virasri Hevage Nisaja, Deumini Fernando is a final year data science undergraduate pursuing a BSc Honours in Information Technology at the Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology, Sri Lanka. Her research interests include big data, machine learning, data analytics, data security, and data science. Let's invite them to do the presentation. Uh, they are presenting online, so we'll ask the organizing committee to play their pre-recorded video. Hi everyone, I'm Radesh Hilary, one of the authors of this paper, and I will be presenting this paper to the second international conference on advances in ICT for emerging regions of University of Colombo School of Computing, Sri Lanka, 2022. And our research paper is titled as Automated Vehicle Insurance Claim Processing Using Computer Vision Natural Language Processing. The co-authors along with me are Abmani Kumaragi, Vidya Sagar Tiaganadan, Nisaja Fernando, and Dr. Lakmini Abhivadhan. And our paper ID is 92. Now let me start with giving you all a brief introduction about the topic that we have chosen. So if we track traditional machine screening process, there are major drawbacks. So what are these drawbacks? There is a lot of waiting time involved while waiting for an assessor. So in this process, since there is human intervention, by means of an assessor, there may be human errors, frauds, which may lead to claims leakage at a later time. And if the damage repair cost given by the insurer is not satisfied due to less transparency in the process, there will be an unsatisfied customer who might turn over at a later time. So this is traditional insurance claim process that we all Sri Lankans undergo again and again when we face such a situation. So what if we can get the claims on the go? So now to approach a solution claims on the go, we have three main objectives. Automating the process to reduce the time taken to start the initial claim process, increasing the transparency in the automated claim process to avoid claims leakage and frauds by analyzing the images to automate the process to reduce the time taken to get a minor damage claims amount released quickly. So let's see how we have broken down these complex objectives into simple innovative solutions. Now let's focus on our first objective, which is automatically filling the initial claims requesting form. Through this objective, we try to answer the question like how to speed up and increase the efficiency of the vehicle insurance claim process, and identify drawbacks of the existing manual documentation process. Now, previous research related to this automatic vehicle claims process does not consider the automation of the documentation process, while current existing systems used for the automatic form filling process do not consider the terminology specified for the vehicle insurance claim industry. So the component of this research is to build the voice recognition system to automatically fill up the first confirmation documentation after an accident using the information provided by the claimant. So under this component, there are two components, namely ASR system for con converting voice input to the text, text classification model for identifying relevant fields related to the insurance claim process. Now, focusing on the methodology, 
Now, when a user needs to request an insurance claim after an accident, registered user can open the application and request the insurance claim by giving a description of the vehicle, policyholder, driving, driver accident, and the damages as voice input. So after that, the component will convert the audio clip into a set of text and the text paragraph will identify and classify the information into a set of fields like vehicle details, policyholder details, description about the accident, and the description about the damage. For the automatic speech recognition process, Transformer, the architecture-based transfer learning algorithm provides 70% accuracy, which was less than expected. Therefore, the authors decided to continue this ASR process using Google Speech API, which provides approximately 99% accuracy. So in order to identify the and classify custom line fields related to the vehicle insurance claim process from input voice record name and recognition based model was used with spacey pipeline in Python. So the model identifies accident location, time, vehicle model, relationship, and the policy holder, accident description, driver's name, the policy number with more than 85% accuracy while the NER model provides overall 70% accuracy for identifying all nine fields, which are mandatory for the initial documentation process in the vehicle claims process. Now, this table shows the uh, identifying nine fields and the relevant accuracies for these fields. Next, let's take a look at our second objective, which is vehicle identification and fraud detection. Now, in order to increase the transparency in the system, vehicle will be assessed whether it's the same as the insured vehicle. This step is divided into three steps to increase the accuracy and deliver reliable output. Let's take a look at the methodology. Now, to identify the make and model of a vehicle, a transfer learning based deep learning model is built. For transfer learning, VGG16 model is used. So, the model is fully linked layers known as dense layers were not loaded to train the model from scratch to the given new specific objective of identifying the vehicle, make, and the model. So the following VTG16 architecture added a flattened layer and a dense layer with dropouts of rate 0.2. Finally, a dense layer is added to predict the vehicle make and the model. Adam optimizer, categorical cross entropy and both ReLU and softmax functions were used as parameters for this model. For extracting the number plate information, Google Test Track OCR was used. Now, the data set used for developing the models are as follows. For make and model identification, publicly available Stanford car data set was used. So this data set was ordered to get only the relevant make and model in Sri Lankan context. And finally, data set had around 3,096 unique RGB images with 40 different make and model classes. Now, these images possess different lighting conditions and the dimension of these pictures were reduced to 224 by 224. For the number plate detection, vehicle images were scrapped from the web with both front and rear view images with the number plates. And finally, data set had around 512 RGB images with different lighting conditions. Dimensions of these images were reduced to 360 by 240 pixels. And this is due to reduce the processing power and time in test track, in, in test track engine. So the make and model identification had an accuracy of 92%. The number plate verification results had an accuracy of 95% accuracy, which has a clear picture, which shows as shown in the presentation slide. So both the model vehicle make and model identification and number plate verification were combined as an API to serve our final objective of verifying the vehicle. So in this, in the backend process, a rule-based algorithm is used to calculate the similarity score. Now, if the vehicle similarity score is above 85%, then the vehicle will be verified. And any anomalies will be flagged and will be resolved by an authorized admin user for increased accuracy and to make error free decisions. Next, our final objective, which is vehicle external damage detection and claim cost calculation. Now, here in this objective, uh, the objective of this component uh, is to automate this process. So, using this application, assessors do not need to come to the accident location, and the claimants also can give a pre claim settlement. So the research problem, which is addressed in this component, is how to automate the detection of the vehicle's external damages and calculate the total claims amount accurately and efficiently. So most of the existing systems were implemented to calculate the claims cost by only detecting the damage location. location. So the novelty in this component is to calculate the claim cost 
by considering the exact damage component and the damage time. So in the manual claims process, there can be intentional or unintentional human errors, which might lead to claims leakage. So by automating this process, we can reduce or eliminate this error. So at the final stage of this research, the objective was to implement an application to take the vehicle damages and then classify the damages according to the damage component type and the severity of the damage and calculate the total claims cost for the damages using computer vision techniques. The diagram shows the full process of how the system works for the damage component and type identification model. Here, initially, when the user uploads the image, system checks whether the image is an image of a vehicle or not. Then the system checks whether the image is damaged or not. Then the system checks the component and the type of the images and then calculate the total claims cost considering the damage type, damage type, component, and the severity. So for the damage component and type detection model, we implemented an efficient NetB3 architecture showed as showed the highest accuracy, and the model was able to identify the shown classes. And also, two validation models were implemented to identify whether the event is a vehicle or not, and the damaged or not. So VTG16 architecture model and mobile net architecture provided the highest accuracy for the two models. So finally, for the severity identification as minor, moderate, and major, and calculate the claims amount for each damage considering the damage component type and the severity along with the total claims amount by integrating all the models and completing the front-end development. So as a part of future work, uh, we hope to provide multilingual support so that people who are speaking different languages can also use this app. And uh, we are hoping to improve further to such that we can provide more damage detections through a single image and also develop the app as a cross-platform system. So currently it is only developed in Android system. So uh, that brings to the end of our presentation and thank you. Uh, thank you for the good, very good presentation. Uh, may I know whether uh, Rajesh, Yaganathan, or Devani are here online? Uh, yes, madam. We are. Yes, ma okay, three of you are here. Yes, ma'am. Okay, good morning. Very good morning. Yes, thank you for the nice presentation. Uh, now, do you have any questions, audience? So even if they do not post, uh, ask any questions right now, they might have posted already some questions to the sledo.com. Please uh, check the sledo.com, then you can answer the questions there. So I might be having, yes, uh, I have written some questions here. <laughs> Because uh, it's a nice presentation, nice work that you have uh, done. Uh, I feel that actually uh, this kind of a thing can be uh, used, and also um, already there are there may be we have heard some quite similar research work already presented, but this might be an improved version since because you have considered a lot of things there. Uh, but the problem is actually the uh, the the input data. Then when you're considering the image, the photographs, the, um, the text uh, content, do you think that the, the accuracy or the validity of this content would be um, guaranteed and would be enough? Uh, 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 in for some part components and uh, all the components, we use some frequency techniques to the uh, inputting in the image. So, uh, through these uh, preposing techniques, we are like checking the lighting conditions, uh, distortion, and the noise in the image. And like uh, we are uh, considering uh, some aspects and we are validating the image uh, whether it is to be processed or not. So that part is added in the uh, like the content part of the application. So uh, it is not uh, actually presented in the uh, presentation. Uh, yes, Tiaganathan, I think uh, that was a little bit noisy. Uh, maybe uh, are you seated in a uh, closed environment? Uh, if it is not, please uh, close the door, or then uh, the surrounding noise is coming. Uh, we didn't hear it very clearly. Give me one more. Yeah. 
yes, the, then the, while considering the uh, input, the quality of it, I also felt that actually uh, there is a real limitation here uh, with the, the English language. I think, did you check whether uh, we can try it with uh, Sinhala and Tamil as well? Uh, actually, uh, not, madam. Uh, we are, uh, as a future work, we are going to try with simple language, uh, but the limitation in this uh, work is that actually we have to uh, develop a, a, a custom model in a spacey uh, uh, architecture uh, for the, uh, really uh, customized for the in, uh, insurance industry. So we have to gather a lot of data uh, in even in the English language also. Uh, so, uh, in future, we are uh, trying to uh, collect uh, some text, uh, text uh, paragraphs using Sinhala, and we uh, will give a try to uh, do this in Sinhala language also. Okay, so this this version uh, you have done with the uh, Google app, I think, for the translation of the text to speech. Uh, yes, madam. Initially, yes. I tried it using uh, transformer. Uh, based architecture, uh, transfer, uh, transfer learning algorithms, uh, but the accuracy is uh, less expect, expected. Uh, so uh, as uh, suggestions uh, from my supervisor and other panel members, uh, we, uh, the authors try, uh, uh, try to go, uh, actually continue the work with Google Speech API because it's uh, given 99% accuracy, as well as there's a uh, uh, smaller limitation in transformers algorithm because it's recognized as zero, uh, as O, uh, so uh, when we are the user providing the some uh, numbers, uh, the uh, algorithm can't actually recognize those numbers. They recognize it as a zero. So Google API uh, provide a solution to that problem. Okay, so but did you idea. test this? Uh, did you test this one with real scenario? Yes, madam. But the accuracy would be maybe because the pronunciation of the language would be different from person to person and. Uh, that would be a very big hindrance for this yeah, kind of yeah, madam, that's uh, the, uh, We tried it uh, 12 kind of entities, but the accuracy is given for the nine entities in real scenario, like a name, uh, policyholder names, driver name, NIC numbers, policyholder numbers, likewise. Uh, so the accuracy wise, we also uh, try to uh, improve the uh, entities as well. Uh, initially, this system identified only nine entities. Uh, which, which is really uh, important to mandatory to fill the initial claim processing. Uh, so uh, the other entities are, I think, uh, the one or two entities I missed. Uh, other, otherwise, other all the man, uh, mandatory information are uh, identified by the system. Okay, thank you. So uh, thank you very much, yes, for sharing with us your good work and being here today. Uh, Let's clap hand for them. Let's move to the next presentation. The presentation is uh, the paper ID 122, 122. Uh, the, present, the title is HASTA, Online Learning Platform for Hearing Impaired. The presentation will be done by Danula Vanasingha. He's a current. He he is currently an undergraduate at the Slate, and uh, reading B.Sc. Honors in Information Technology, specializing in Data Science. Uh, currently, uh, is a uh, she's in final year of a degree program. Miss Danula or Danula, I wonder whether she's or he. So uh, let's uh, invite our organizing committee to play the pre-recorded video. Good morning, everyone. I'm Tarantu Vinasinghe, and it is a great pleasure for us to present our paper here today at the 22nd International Conference on Advances in ICT for Emerging Regions 2022. Today, we will be presenting our paper related to the online learning platform named HASTA under paper ID 122, which is developed for the hearing impaired community of Sri Lanka. Moving to the introduction, hearing impairment is defined as the inability of an individual to hear sounds in any capacity. Hearing impaired individuals cannot communicate in normal ways, instead use a sign language as their main communication medium. 
It is a common misconception that sign language is the same around the world, but that is not true. Sri Lankan sign language is a dialect of Sri sign language used specifically by the hearing impaired community of Sri Lanka. The objective of this research is to provide an online learning platform specifically designed for the hearing impaired community of Sri Lanka, providing solutions to the problems that they face. Looking at the research problem, there are many learning platforms that are developed to aid the hearing impaired community around the world. But no such learning platform has been implemented to support the hearing impaired people in Sri Lanka to provide solutions to their learning gaps. As a solution, we have introduced the Hustle online learning platform with four main components focusing on four main problems faced by the hearing impaired community of Sri Lanka. Moving on to the first component, the video captioning module of this system focuses on converting the content of a YouTube video to sign language and presenting it to the hearing impaired user along with emotion analysis. This is essential as hearing impaired people cannot refer to these videos since most of hearing impaired are unable to read better at elementary level, meaning that they have trouble referring to transcriptions provided. Also, facial emotions play an important role in sign language. This component was developed using NLP te techniques for text to sign language conversion with a combination of facial, text, and speech emotion analysis to identify the emotion. Facial emotion was identified with an accuracy of 97% using deep face library, and text emotion was identified using weather sentiment analysis with an accuracy of 84%. Finally, speech emotion recognition was done by training a multi-layer perception classification module with an accuracy of 79%. The overall system has the capability of converting content of a YouTube video to Sri Lankan sign language with emotion with an accuracy of 78%. The following two images represent the input and output use interfaces of the web application developed. So that's it from the Sri Lankan sign language captioning module. Over to you, Chamaka. Thank you, Tarindu. So the teaching and evaluation section of HASTA is implemented in two components. In the teaching component, the content is taught to the user by using the avatar model that's built using the Blender. And then there's a separate section for knowledge evaluation. In there, the gesture that is presented by the user is detected using webcam plus media by policy and then it's compared with the answer that is already trained using LSTA. This comparison is done through algorithms that are developed. And there are two separate algorithms that are developed for static and simple dynamic signs and also for dynamic signs with multiple gestures. That is because when multiple gestures are involved, there can be partially correct answers. When multiple gestures are involved, the system also displays the correct percentage, as can be seen in this screenshot. So that the use, using this system, the users can evaluate themselves if their answer is correct, wrong, or if it's partially correct, but part of their answer is correct. As well as along with the evaluation, the correct answer is displayed so that users can get to know where they actually got wrong. With this system, we expect to provide the users effective learning experience just like for regular system, just like for regular users. This is about the teaching component, and to discuss about the next component, over to you, Hasini. Thank you, Chamaka. So this component translates Sri Lankan sign language into American sign language. When it comes to sign language, there is no standardized sign language worldwide. As a result, sign language can vary from country to country. The objective of this component is to give an opportunity for the hearing impaired community of Sri Lanka to learn a foreign sign language. Then moving on to the methodology, initially the user will get to provide a gesture in Sri Lankan sign language through the web camera and it will be converted to a text output. And that relevant text will be translated to the corresponding gesture in American sign language. The translated gesture will be denoted to the user through a pre-trained avatar model. Uh, so as the initial stage, a selected range of words belonging to a few main categories 
like numbers, colors, months, and days are chosen to translate. According to the type of the gesture, the signs are categorized into two parts, a static and dynamic gesture. Uh, each category of gestures are trained separately using CNN and LSTM models and were able to obtain an accuracy of 85%. So that's about it for the American Sign Language Translation component and uh, over to you, Dana. Thank you, Rasi. I'm Dana Ranasi, who is presenting the final component of Google search model of the project Hustler, an online learning platform, Hearing Impact. My, my Google search model component has three main modules. In, in the very first model, it converts Sri Lankan sign language text. In my solution, Sri Lankan hearing impact person use the web feed to present the, present the query that the user needs to convert to the text and use the Google search model. So in first, it identifies the uh, actions or signs that perform in the user using media by policy keepers. Then it uses TensorFlow and KRS to build this deep neural network of LSTM layers that could identify those media by holistic key points and then convert it to the text. So the output of this module is an array actually. Then, uh, then we can uh, convert it to a string, a single string, and then use as the Google search model. Then I use uh, Google, uh, I use Python and Google search uh, modules uh, to build the Google search model. Uh, therefore, then it use that output the string output of the uh, converted text, converted Sri Lankan sign language, then it redirects to the Google search. Then the finally, the first paragraph of the research results converts to the Sri Lankan sign language back again. It, it, so therefore, it makes the user to identify the uh, content in sign language too, rather than reading the entire page. So it makes the user to easily uh, grab the knowledge using Google search. So that is the main methodology uh, of the Google search model. Then this is the very first main UI user interface for Google search module user. So this is the end of the component. So let's discuss about the future. So Hasta is currently developed for Sri Lankan sign language only. So it can be uh, developed for other sign language dialects such as American sign language, British sign language, and many more. Therefore, uh, can we expand the development to convert Sri Lankan sign language into any dialect sign language at the moment? It converts only to Sri Lankan sign language to American sign language only. And finally, Hasta is currently captions only YouTube videos in English language. And further development could be done for caption videos in any language. Those are the key future works that can be done through Hasta, an online learning platform for hearing in that. Thank you very much. And any questions? Thank you. So, uh... Sorry, I, sorry, we haven't received your biographies, uh, Chamatka Hasini Tarindu. So that's why I didn't read them. Uh, so are you online now? Yes, ma'am. So there are four of you? No, just three? Uh, yes, actually. Yes, actually one member has a technical issue and she won't be able to join the session now. Uh, so we three will be answering the viva. So are you all from SLWIT? Yes. Okay. Uh, so glad to have you here. Yes, audience. Uh, Maybe due to the time limitations, I will go read the questions without waiting more. Uh, waiting, uh, let's see. Yes. So in your research, uh, uh, you have considered the sign language, uh, but uh, I believe that uh, the sign language, uh, the people who use the uh, use sign language, they have they use hand gestures as well as facial expressions. Uh, did you consider them both? Uh, Tarindu, you are muted. Uh -huh. Can you hear me now? Yes, Tarindu. Yeah. So actually, we have considered both uh, facial emotions and uh, gestures as well for the research. Could you spe speak a little bit louder? Yeah, sure. So actually, we have uh, considered both uh, facial emotions as well as the gestures of the sign language. 
um, so that means the interpretation of the meaning has been referred to both hand gestures and the facial expressions. Yes, ma'am, that's right. Okay. So then the, when you are reporting Hidea, the, you said that uh, for emotion recognition, you have given 70% of uh, weightage to text and 20% and 10% weightages for facial expressions and speech respectively. So why speech 10%? Because you have considered the uh, hearing impaired uh, participants. And then I guess uh, I was wondering why you, how you have allocated these 70, 20, 10 uh, percentages. Uh, yes, ma'am. Actually, so if we take the uh, speech emotion recognition, if we give a, a, a high wage uh, there are some people has a monotonous voice so that might not be said so that's why we have given a high weightage for text and a low weightage for speech emotion recognition and also we have given a very little uh, weightage for facial expressions because uh, most of videos does, uh, does not have a uh, like cannot identify a face in some videos so that's why we have given 10 percent weightage for uh, facial emotion recognition okay uh, in your report you have written 20% for the facial and 10% for the speech. So my question is why you have allocated 10% for speech? Yes, ma'am. So because uh, if you take speech, uh, like, like when a person speaks, that doesn't re uh, reflect the exact uh, meaning of, like the exact emotion that uh, is interpreted in the text. So like if I say that uh, I'm going home, I can say it with a happy voice and a monotonous voice as well. So that's why we have given a less uh, percentage for speech emotion recognition. But you are working with the hearing impaired students now. Yes, ma'am. So we are trying to interpret the emotions uh, interpreted in the uh, YouTube videos. So we are trying to uh, convert, the, uh, identify the emotion and uh, represent it with an uh, emoji through the video, like through the uh, interpretation that we are showing to the uh, hearing impaired person. Maybe you are referring to sounds, no? Just not the words. Yes, the sounds. Okay, okay. So then the, the question was actually about the percentages, the exact amounts on what basis you consider like 70, 20, 10. Now you, I, we can say that yes, the majority were like 70 and 20 were less. So, but uh, I just want to know whether did you refer to literature or any other document uh, saying that 70, 20, 10 would be the ideal selection? Yes, ma'am. I, I went through some research papers and identified that uh, this would be the ideal amounts to be uh, represented. Okay, thank you. That clarifies my doubt. Uh, I hope that uh, if the audience are also having some questions, they might post the question to slido.com. Please uh, check the slido and answer their questions. Uh, thank you once again for being here and presenting your and answering the questions as well. Thank you. So let's clap hand for them. We'll go to the next one. Our next paper ID is 129 Smart Driver Assistance for Traffic Sign for Toll vehicle malfunction and accident detection. The presenter is Varna Vitanage. He is a final year student reading bachelor degree in information technology, specializing in computer systems and network engineering at Faculty of Computing, Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology. Uh, he is also presenting the paper online. So uh, I invite the organizing committee to play the recorded video. Greetings everyone. I'm Farman Vithanake, the final year undergraduate at Sri Lanka Institute of Information Technology. I'm presenting my final year research title, Smart Driver Assistant for Traffic Sign, but Hold, Vehicle Malfunction and Accident Detection. Dr driving is a huge responsibility that must be learned in steps and practice over and over. We have to drive safely, obey the traffic laws, respect the rights of other drivers. Not only should we concentrate on our own driving, we should also be well aware of other vehicles around us. 
There are a lot of reasons that can cause car accidents. Among these factors, such as traffic signs and road condition, can greatly affect safety and compromise road safety if neglected. Traffic signs provide valuable information to drivers and other road users. They represent rules that are in place to keep you safe and help to communicate messages to drivers and pedestrians that can maintain order and reduce accidents. Neglecting them can be dangerous. Aside from negligence, drivers can unintentionally miss road signs due to visual impairments, bad weather conditions, heavy road conditions. Undetermined number of car accidents are caused by poor and dangerous traffic conditions. Even the best and most defensive drivers can fall off guard by a sudden problem in the road, losing control of their vehicle and crashing. After the background study, we realized that there are no current accident solutions to address these problems and points. While many high-end vehicles are equipped with technologies such as intelligent road sign condition systems and road suspension systems, most cars in the market only come with basic driving instruments. Therefore, there's a need for a universal driver assistance system that can be plugged into any vehicle to assist drivers in minimizing road casualties. This research aims to develop an IoT-based intelligent system for detecting and analyzing road signs, or holes, vehicle malfunctions, and road accidents, and inform drivers before they approach them. Propos system has four major components, including road sign detection, road time, real-time alerting mechanism, pothole detection, and accident detection. This figure in the slide illustrates the logical diagram of overall system abstracting all four components. Each of those components are integrated and work simultaneously to achieve expected functionalities. Each of these components will be discussed separately in upcoming slides. In order to capture the road signs, a high quality camera with, uh, is used with the Raspberry Pi and is needed to get the live video feed. We use 12 megapixel camera, which can output 15 to 20 frames per second. And these images were enhanced with OpenCV library for better classification. And for the classification, we use YOLO V5 algorithm. Web camera is used to get the live feed from the background. And these frames were monitored through YOLO V5 backbone architecture to identify the real time objects and classify them. After classifying, they will be stored in a remote database with corresponding geolocations. And the developed web app will will access these data and visualize road sign information. Since there were no Sri Lankan road science data sets available, the team had to make a data set for further deal model development. Hence, data set with around 1,700 were collected, including children crossing, pedestrian crossing, no honking, and speed limit, and etc. After gathering the data, they will label accordingly to the 18 classes and proceeded to algorithm training. To evaluate the object and detection model, we use mean average precision, recall, and accuracy scores based on 1,000 data samples, and they showcase scores of 0 0.83, 0 0.71, and 0 0.81, respectively. For real time alerting mechanism, OBD2 was used to gather the vehicle mechanical information by reading ECU electron, electronic control unit of the vehicle. OBD2 communicates with microprocessor via Bluetooth communication. Speed forth was from OBDD, and it is proceeded by microprocessor to calculate the time to the sign with using distance in distress matrix API. Device calculates exact time to alert the driver about the road sign using T equals S over U equation. After that, all the, da the data will be stored in a SQL database. And in order to give the voice command to the driver, the device will access this database and all the labels will be converted 
to the uh, voice commands using text to speech converter and the uh, voice commands will be uh, given to the drivers one minute prior to the traffic sign. Acceleration is the rate of change of the velocity of an object with respect to time. Angular velocity is the prime rate at which an object rotates. From past studies, it was observed that impact of a pothole moderately affects acceleration of C axis, angular velocity of X, and Y axis of the vehicle. Hence, authors came to the conclusion to use the acceleration of 0.5 g, pitch rate, and roll rate of 0.15. 0.28 respectively, respectively for as the threshold levels for a hall detection. Device monitors road conditions using accelerometer and a gyroscope, and they will be preprocessed. They are preprocessed in the Raspberry Pi microprocessor and sent to a ML model deployed in cloud for the classification. After the classification, they will be labeled with their corresponding geo level coordinates and will be sent to a remote MySQL database, which will be later will be uh, accessed by the web application uh, to visualize road condition information to drivers with the integration of Google Maps API. Since most of the past studies has taken vision-based image processing, after robot hole detection, there were no data set available to be using vibration-based approach. Thus, it was required to manually collect the data set by using vehicle by attaching experimental setup to the vehicle. The data collection was done by maintaining vehicle speed of 40 to 60 kilometers per hour. In this process, vehicle was driven in both bad and good roads for about 20 kilometers to collect sufficient data for analyzation. To test the formula system, different machine learning classifiers were tested and random force classifier and support vector machine classifiers scored the highest accuracy level. Initially, the data set was tested with the random force classifier and even though it showed higher accuracy, we inspected that data was all fitting with the classifiers and it showed a big variance between cross validation and train scores. Hence, support vector machine was trained with radial basis kernel and achieved 96.6 accuracy. And against the data, test data sets, SPC could score precision recall F1 scores of 0 0.98, 0 0.9, 0 0.949, respectively. For accelerometer, devices use a flame sensor, vibration sensor, and an accelerometer determine accident status. Once the accident is detected, data will be sent to a remote server and system will determine the severity degree of the accident on a scale of low, medium, and high. If the system de determines the severity level is high or medium, it will instantly inform the local police station and emergency medical clinics. For the geo positioning and for, for, to find the nearby police stations and hospitals, this use Google, places API, nearby service API for their integrations. The accelerometer sensor module is essential vehicle accident detection component. And when device detects a certain variance in G process, device activate the automated emergency dialing system. From the past studies conducted in recent years, threshold levels abstracted in trigger 13 were identified and they were used to trigger the event of accident. If the accident is of medium or high severity, the system will identify the nearest hospital and police station. All the data included in SQL database and accident spot, time of accident and severity level of accident are also updated to the cloud database. The system will then use the IFTT protocol and GSM module to automatically send SMS notification about the accident to the concerned parties. If the severity level of accident is low, the system will automatically overlook the occurrences. Basic design of the system is to develop a portable 
plug and play device which can be attached to the dashboard or the screen of the vehicle. This device contains an information display with 3.5 inch touch, AFT touchscreen display, which can be powered up using a 5 volt power adapter. Road sign detection functionality detects to the road sign using a camera and image processing techniques, and it locks all the sign information in the database to inform the drivers using voice commands about the traffic sign with regards to relevance. This is the final prototype being implemented for the device. Enclosure was built with plastic and aluminum, and this device can be mounted on the dashboard of the vehicle, and one meter long white camera can be mounted on the windscreen of the vehicle. TV screen on the device enables drivers to access the information functionality at ease. These footages were taken from a test drive we performed to check road sign detection functionality with US radar to the vehicle. As you can see, it detected the road signs along the road with a positive level of confidence. And this was done with average speed of between 4 to 60 km per hour by acquiring 30 frames per second bar from camera input. This live video was taken while testing the functionality of notification mechanism. Two kilometers ahead. This is road sign of pedestrian crossing. As you can see, the device is upcoming traffic signs and inform the driver one minute prior they passed them. Voice assistant information, including type of traffic, traffic sign, distance to the traffic sign from the ground vehicle based on the vehicle speed, are given by the voice assistant. Two kilometer. These footages were taken while testing road condition detection functionality. On bad road, it detects clusters of pothole and record them. On flat road, in a good shape, it reads steady zero readings as there are no potholes on the road. We develop end use application as a web app and deploy it in the onboard device. And driver can choose either the road sign map, road condition map to retrieve the useful information. As for the future work, we are expecting to develop a platform that can assist road development authorities, which can provide information on signs and road condition for effective and efficient road development process. Moreover, we are hoping to integrate information maps with Google Maps navigation service as a plugin for better experience, which mitigates the use of separate platform live navigation. Since this device has dimensions of 10 to 7 to 5 centimeters, we are expecting to focus on shrinking the size of the device in order to make it more portable and convenient. Finally, we are focusing on improving the accuracy of the device by replacing sensors with industrial level sensors and increasing the accuracy of model using more data. Thank you. Thank you, Arna. Um, I think you have used different types of uh, technologies to develop a nice system. Are you online? Uh, yes, ma'am. OK. Uh, so Arna, now uh, when there was another presentation at the same session uh, from Yogya, were you online during that time as well? Uh, yes, I was. Okay. Did you see any similarity? Uh, yes, I did. Okay. Uh, what can you say about it? Uh, for the reason we didn't take the mobile phone uh, approach because uh, the very thing, the reasons you mentioned there, because we have to position the mobile phone uh, regularly to you know the capture the data and. It uh, for the, uh, no, the for the like uh, road sign detection uh, functionality it uh, requires more hardware resources, so that's why we uh, moved to uh, decided to develop a separate uh, device for all the these functionalities. Okay, so uh, let's see whether Yogya is online. Yogya, hello, are you online? Yoga come again. This looks like she's not here. 
Okay. Uh, so I will be giving you a question, uh, Varna. Now I have a, a question, a uh, little bit doubt. Um, now I can see that uh, Volvo 5 is a recent version. Now you have used it. Okay. So were you able to uh, improve that by adding some changes or did you do some changes to it or just used it as it is? Uh, we just uh, used it as the our object detection algorithm, and uh, we use the OpenCV library to do the uh, the preprocessing of images to improve the images to uh, the uh, improve the saturation and the brightnesses of the uh, image inputs. Mm -hmm. So you didn't do any improvements to uh, what our file, but you just uh, used it. Uh, yes, ma'am. Okay, then uh, did you test this one in the real scenario? Uh, yeah, uh, as I uh, in, as I uh, included some footages in the slide, uh, we tested this uh, after implementing the actual device. We tested this on uh, several roads in Colombo, and uh, for the most of uh, in the mods road, uh, it uh, out of like ten uh, signs, uh, it was able to detect more than uh, more than eight signs. Okay, so then what specific drawbacks were there in the existing systems that you have identified earlier could be solved by with this system? Uh, as speaking of the... Um, but hall detection, the rod condition monitoring, as I said, uh, the mobile phone-based approach is uh, quite uh, error-based because, uh, as I say, it, we have to you know regularly uh, position it in a fixed place. And uh, as we use the mobile phones and uh, everything for daily functions, uh, we can depend on it to do these uh, functions. So uh, we mitigated that issue. And uh, for the road sign detection, uh, Uh, they were only uh, they were existing systems. Uh, most of the existing systems were uh, based on the they were tested, done on different countries. There were no existing solution specifically done in Sri Lanka, so that's why we did it. Okay, okay, thank you, uh, Varna. Uh, due to the uh, time re restrictions, I cannot continue with the discussion. But uh, you have done a very good work. So let's uh, clap hands for the him. Uh, for Ms. Mr. Varna, yes. Thank you. With that, we have to uh, wind up the session uh, for the IT applications session. We have we could not uh, play the recording of the one of these presentations. Um, I think presentation ID is uh, yes, paper ID sixty seven. He has uh, she has not. Uh, Present attending online even. So we are not presenting it uh, today. Uh, uh, maybe if she's attending online and maybe in the later, we will try to uh, fix the schedule and let, give you a chance to hear to her. So um, thank you so much for being here and then uh, participating the presentation, attending this presentation. Yes, we have one physical presenter here, physical attending presenter, and uh, those who are attending online as well. Thank you so much. And uh, those who have posted the questions to slido.com, thank you so much for the questions that you have posted. And the authors, uh, presenters, please uh, submit the post your answers to the uh, system. Thank you. Well, thank you once again. So we can wind up the session now. Uh, it was indeed interesting to watch all those presentations. So I take this moment to thank all the presenters. And now I kindly invite Dr. Tushani Veera Singh, the chairperson of the session, to award the certificate to the presenter who is here in person. Uh, so to collect the certificate of appreciation, I invite Chamodi Jayati Lekar, the author of the paper, an augmented reality-based fashion design interface with artistic contents generated using deep generative models.
Now I would like to take a moment to appreciate Dr. Tushane Veera Singh for managing the session smoothly. Uh, so to present her with a token of appreciation, I cordially invite Professor Kapila Dias. Thank you, sir, for your cooperation. Now let's move into the second session of paper presentations for the day. Here the theme is a mix of physical computing, IoT and image processing under the open track. So uh, since there are four presenters who have joined with us physically, we will first go through those presentations, break for lunch, and then continue with the rest of the presentations after lunch. So uh, to uh, um, now I uh, like to wa warmly welcome the chairperson of the session, Dr. D.N. Ranasinghe. Huh? Uh, Dr. D.N. Ranasinghe has been a senior academic at the University of Colombo School of Computing for over 30 years. He has widely published and has supervised a number of research students. His research interests are in distributed systems, combinatorial optimization, and processor architectures. With that, I'd like to hand over the control of the session to Dr. D.N. Ranasinghe. Good afternoon, uh, uh, and it's almost past 12 o'clock, and it's lunch, lunch time, and I have a difficult uh, task of managing this session. Anyhow, we will break <clears throat> session five into two parts. First, we will have four present, uh, presentations for those who are physically here, and I must thank them for being uh, physically here. And let me, uh, without uh, wasting too much time, uh, our First presentation this session uh, is on the topic, a high interaction physics aware ICS honeypot for industrial environments. And it will be presented by uh, Kannan Krishikesan, Gayakanta Jayakodi, IS Halavarachi, and Chandana Gamage, all from Department of Computer Science and Engineering, University of Morotua. And it will be presented by Krishi Kesan, who is a graduate from the Department of Computer Science and Engineering. He also has an advanced diploma in management and accounting, and his interest lie in cybersecurity and designing elegant systems. Let me welcome uh, Mr. Krishi Kesan to deliver his uh, paper. Good afternoon to all of you. I am Kanan Krishigeshan, and my team members are Gayakanda Jayakodi, Ayesh Halavarachi, and Chandra Gamagi. We are here to present a high interaction physics surveyor ICS honeypot for industrial environments, supervised by Dr. Chandra Gamagi. Cyber physical systems are integrations of computation, networking, and physical processes. Uh, nuclear power plants, power grids, Distribution of pipelines of oil and water, as well as railway and transport systems, use cyber physical systems to control their highly integrated components. Industrial control systems, or ICS, are basically control intensive CPS. For the past, uh, past years, there have been several attacks on ICS systems Stuxnet from 2010, Industroyer on 2016, Meteor from 2020, and Darkside on 2021. These attacks are none other than the attacks which attack the exact system that was shown in the previous slides. So engineers who wanted to protect these systems have deployed several countermeasures such as firewalls, policies and procedures, 
IDS, IPS, um, etc. But these cannot analyze or block zero-day attacks. Honeypots are such countermeasures which can analyze and block zero-day attacks. They are used as they are basically deceptive servers to detect, deflect, and trap attackers as well as delay them. So this is a architecture of uh, where the honeypot is placed in an internal network. When an attacker enters into the internal network, he will, be, he will encounter a packet filter firewall. And after that, the honeypot and the real system will be deployed in parallel. So um, uh, any behavior which does not comply with the actual um, behavior will be redirected to the honeypot. So the attacker attacks the honeypot instead. There exist several issues in PLC-based honeypots. There are a lot of low or medium interaction honeypots, but um, even though they are easy to implement or low cost, their, their deceptive capabilities are quite low because the attacker cannot take a lot of steps to attack them. So we cannot identify the complex attacking patterns. There are a few high interaction honeypots, but every one of them lack some kind of uh, disability. So uh, one of them is lack of physics awareness. And uh, the second one is lack of network protocol implementation. And one of the most important one is the inability to inject ladder logic. And all of these honeypots, they just log interaction, but ha cannot handle or react to various types of attacks, which makes the attacker uh, not reveal his attack vector. So uh, moving on to system design, our project objective is to develop a high interaction honeypot addressing all the necessary requirements to achieve high deception capabilities through physical process simulation, responding as a real ICS, and integration of major ICS network protocols, as well as interconnecting them using SDN technology to produce an industrial-based honeypot. So currently, the state-of-the-art honeypot, Honey PLC, uh, is used as the baseline to develop our honeypot, Honey PLC++. So this Honey PLC is, um, uh, is proven to be one of the highest deceptive capability honeypot through Shodan's honey score, which is a matrix to evaluate, um, evaluate the deception capabilities of a honeypot. So in our proposed solution, we have improved the state of the art honey PLC to develop honey, honey PLC++ by integrating a physical process simulation, implementing the Modbus communication protocol since all the other main ICS communication protocols are implemented within honey PLC and interconnecting the uh, honey PLC system uh, using an SDN switch with the ICS. Moving on to system design architecture. So this is um, the architecture that we have used uh, to interconnect our honey PLC to the industrial system. So as you can see, the industrial control system, a human machine interface, which just shows a graphical interface of the state of the uh, system and the several honey PLC++ um, coupled with HoneySim++. Uh, which will be explained uh, after this, uh, is deployed in parallel. And uh, the attacker, as soon as he enters into the system, he encounters a gateway or VPN. And after that, the, when he attacks, the, um, his traffic will be sent through an STN switch, uh, which is controlled by an STN controller and a snort intrusion detection system. So this set of uh, components will be, uh, will, he will be helpful in identifying whether this, uh, the traffic is malicious or not, and to redirect the traffic to the Honey PLC systems or the industrial control system. Moving on to prototype implementation. So this is the architecture of Honey PLC++. So here we have a Modbus module, a modified S7.com server, and a physical process simulation to create a fully fledged PLC Honeypot, Honey PLC++. And this, is, this can be used in a production environment. So uh, this has two variants, which we uh, explained further down. And um, uh, one of the most important features of an ICS honeypot is physics awareness. Physics awareness increases the deception capabilities of an ICS honeypot. So uh, to keep the attacker interested enough to reveal his attack vector. Normally when an attacker attacks the system, he would try out simple attacks to, uh, to figure, figure whether this is a honeypot or not. And after that, he will re reveal his actual attack vector. So Honey PLC++ um, is coupled with HoneySim++, which is a water distribution and water purification system developed by our team, 
with proper timing parameters. So this is the architecture uh, of Honeysim++, which has uh, a water storage device, a chlorine sensor device, pump and valves uh, implemented within it, uh, which, will be act, um, which will act as ICS components. So here, the sensors which are um, developed are water level sensor, water flow sensor, chlorine concentration sensor, and the actuators are pumps and valves. We have a human machine interface uh, implemented with ignition SCADA, and this human machine interface will be used to easily identify any attacks done to Honeysim++, uh, which can be used for real-time monitoring. So this is the human machine interface that we have developed for Honeysim++. We have also used SNOT, which is an open source intrusion detection and intrusion prevention system uh, to identify the malicious packets sent um, from the attacker. So uh, we have added SNOT rules for reconnaissance items and uh, S7COM functions such as reading memory blocks or code injection, as well as Modbus register reading and writing. Uh, we have created alert generation, and uh, this was tested using ICMP requests, reconnaissance packets using NMAP, PLC inject and Modbus, Python, Modbus packets using Python scripts. So uh, honeypots can be used as a standalone system as well as um, in a real production environment. So STN technology was used to handle the networking between them. We could not deploy it uh, to a real system because, uh, uh, because of the conditions of the country, but uh, we uh, produced a sample proof of content, uh, concept test setup with uh, virtual networking setup using GNS3, open virtual switch as, uh, as the STN switch, and Rio controller as the STN controller. So this is the network diagram of the uh, proof of control setup, um, concept setup of the um, STN uh, of our system. So we have done several experiments and uh, here are the results. So for the experiment setup, we have used HoneyPLC++, HoneySim++, and Ignition SCADA deployed in separate machines. And IP tables were used to filter and implement NAT in HoneySim++. For SDN proof of concept setup, five Ubuntu virtual machines were used for GNS3 server, the real server, Honeypot server, Ryu controller, and the client. So this is one of the uh, first experiment that we did. And uh, this experiment is the basics a basic uh, attack that an attacker will take. So as you can see, the uh, Honey PLC++ is identified as a Siemens PLC, but even though it is deployed in an Ubuntu environment using NMAP. This is the second reconnaissance experiment. So here we have used Python script to, um, to initiate Modbus device identification call. So here, as you can see, it identifies Honeysim++ as, um, uh, as a real PLC instead of um, an Ubuntu machine. So we have done several intrusion detection experiments using NMAP, PLC inject, and uh, Modbus Python scripts. So this is a, a screenshot of the SNOT uh, rules which were detected when we injected the packets. So as I said before, Honey PLC has uh, two variants. So this is the first variant. Uh, this, was, uh, this was there in Honey PLC. So this variant uh, allows us to test different types of attacks. So here, this variant is not right protected. So, uh, so the in attacker can inject ladder logic injections, code injections. But this um, experiment, shows that this, uh, the injection is accepted within the, within the Honey PLC++. But Honey PLC++ doesn't have the capability to execute the ladder logic programs. So the attacker will, be, will not be convinced that this is, a honey, uh, this is not a honeypot. Uh, and it, the system will run in normal conditions. This is the variant two, and this variant has a right protected Honey PLC++. So here, the, attacker will be notified with an error code saying that this Honey PLC++ is right protected. Therefore, he won't be able to inject lad logic, but he will be able to um, perform other advanced attacking techniques. For the physics awareness experiment, Honeysim++ was tested 
by changing state of the pumps, valves of water and chlorine. So here we observed gradual changes in the levels of chlorine concentration and uh, the water level. There are several fail-safe mechanisms that were implemented in the real ICS. We have also implemented those in our Honeysim++. These fail-safe mechanisms include uh, closing of pumps and valves when, uh, when there's a high pressure buildup. So these kind of fail-safe mechanisms are implemented in Honeysim++, which improves the deceptive capabilities of Honeysim++. So in conclusion, many ICS components and communication protocols were not designed in security in mind. Uh, so to safeguard ICS, behaviors of threat actors should be analyzed first. A prototype honeypot was implemented to identify the behavior of these threat actors. So this prototype system provides all the major uh, ICS network protocols supported by a PLC, which is HTTP, Modbus, and S7 Corp. Honeysim Plus also provides physics awareness and basic fail-safe control logic to the implemented solution. So, Due to the support of major network protocols, physics awareness, high interaction, and the presence of basic fail-safe logic, high deception capabilities were guaranteed for this honeypot. So these are the references that we used in the paper. Uh, thank you, everyone. And uh, questions are welcome. Thank you. Any questions from the audience? I have two questions. How do you distinguish uh, industrial control systems and normal IT systems where honeypots may be used? How do you distinguish, uh, distinguish the requirements among the two? Uh, what is special in, about ICS? In the IC systems, uh, let's just take the normal IT systems. For normal IT systems, we can have general purpose honeypots because uh, all the IT systems have the basic components. But so when an attacker attacks an IT, um, an IT system, he encounters the basics uh, of uh, the basic components that we can expect in a normal system. But um, when you attack an IC system, let's just say you are attacking a water distribution plant. So your attack may contain specific uh, packets which can be interpreted by the ICS component of that water distribution system. So you have to have a honeypot specially made for a water distribution system. And uh, for, let's just say, a smart grid, you have, you have to have another variant of that um, honeypot. So that is where the distinction uh, so, occurs. Yeah, so, so it is a function, a a function dependent? Yeah, it's functional dependent. Uh, any dependency on real-time requirements? Uh, for now, we have Honeysim++, which, is, uh, which, is, which supports water distribution and water purification system. But we have designed Hanisim++ in a way that uh, it can be remodified using the same architecture to develop physical ICS components and redeployed in a different scenario. So it will take one or two months depending on the uh, ICS system, but uh, you can uh, uh, redesign the Hanisim++, but redeploy Hani PLC++ as, as it is uh, to the system. What is the role played by the SDN? Sorry? What is the role played here by the SDN? So SDN is basically, um, it, it redirects traffic between ICS and uh, Honeypot. So when, uh, when an attacker uh, attacks the real system, uh, so this is basically an industrial control, sorry, industrial uh, system Honeypot. So it will be deployed in a production environment. So uh, when an attacker attacks the real system, uh, the SDN controller will determine whether this is an uh, actual mm. packet or actual um, packet or a malicious packet, malicious packet. So uh, SDN controller can change the rules of routing dynamically. That is the role yeah. of SDN controller. Okay. Thank you very much. And uh, let's appreciate uh, Mr. Chris Gason's uh, presentation. Thank you. Thank you. Our next paper is on optimized Kalman filter for smartphone location tracking using GNSS measurements presented by 
Rishoban Yokanathan from University of Colombo. Mr. Rishoban is a student of the University of Colombo following the Master of Computer Science degree. Let me invite him to present his paper. So good afternoon to you. Uh, So uh, I'm glad to present my uh, research paper, optimized Kalman filter for smartphone location, uh, tracking using a uh, GNNS measurements. So the, uh, this research focus on uh, finding the uh, mobile user uh, using a GNNS uh, satellite system. So what are the challenges uh, we are facing uh, to tracking the mobile user? The first one is a uh, noise. That means uh, during the data transmissions or uh, later transmissions, we are facing a uh, uh, signal uh, noises. So the second thing is a harsh environment. So let's say if I send a, if the satellite send a signal, it is not always reach the uh, GNNS receiver because of the environment. So let's say a uh, taller building or uh, hills, forest stations, uh, for this kind of a barrier. So the signal can be uh, disrupted. So the second thing is a uh, absence of uh, base station data. So let's say uh, in other methods, so let's say differential GNNS, so they are using a base station data. So the base station data, it's a, a well-known data. From that one, we can uh, differentiate the mobile user locations. So we are focusing on without using a, a base station data, how we can find the uh, mobile user locations. And the final uh, barrier is uh, uh, mobile phones don't have uh, accurate signal receivers. So in the uh, market, there are lots of uh, commercial GNNS receivers are available, uh, which is very accurate. So due to the uh, cost and the size, uh, mobile vendors uh, don't use that kind of a uh, high accurate uh, GNNS receiver. So everything uh, starting from uh, satellite data. So we call it as a global navigation satellite systems. So it gives a 3D user locations and uh, navigations and time services. So when it comes to this research, uh, we are using a, a multi, multiple GNN systems. Uh, you may aware of it, uh, the GPS is uh, launched by America and uh, GLONASS is from uh, Russia, Galileo is uh, European Union, uh, Beidou, China, and other one is uh, from Israel. So these, uh, each satellite system has a different frequency and uh, different orbiting uh, levels. So in this research, uh, we are also, uh, we are considering the all the GNN systems. So uh, in this part, uh, background, we are uh, analyzing uh, two things. One is a uh, noise. Uh, second thing is uh, uh, what are the methods we are going to use? Uh, there's a uh, two methods we are going to use. So uh, the following slides, uh, we are going to discuss each error. So you may uh, uh, focus on the final uh, thing. That means satellite position uh, during the signal transmissions. So let's say uh, satellite system is position is a very influential thing. So you can see in the picture, so the in the uh, left side, so there's a satellite, so they're sending a, a signal, but it is in the low elevations. So when it's come to uh, sending a signal, satellite should be in the higher elevation. So that means uh, it is on the on site. If the sa satellites are out of sight, sometimes we, the receiver can get the uh, signal. So uh, I will explain how it can happen. So the first error is a clock error. So the GNN systems are using uh, uh, atomic clocks, uh, which is very costly and uh, very accurate. Uh, but uh, the control system, uh, the part of the GNN system, uh, doesn't want to constantly tweak the clocks. The reason is the cost. So if we continuously tweak, uh, it, uh, it creates a lot of cost. So for that barrier, they uh, allow this bias. So what is the uh, influence of this uh, error? So let's say 10 nanoseconds of the clock error results in the three meter in the position error. So it gives some uh, significant influence on the calculating the user position. So the second thing is a natural thing. Uh, so you may notice that uh, Earth is surrounded by a uh, atmosphere. So let's say inosphere, uh, uh, inosphere, uh, atmosphere, and the tropospheric uh, layer. 
So each layer has uh, creating a significant delay in, during the signal transmissions. So let's say atmospheric uh, delay means uh, because of the humidity, temperature, and those kind of things are uh, uh, creating some delays in uh, signal transmissions. And uh, the thing is a uh, multipath. So multipath. So uh, so let's say the signal, uh, the satellite sends a signal. So the GNNS receiver uh, should receive the signal directly from satellite. Sometimes uh, some signal can be reflected from the buildings and receive the GNNS uh, receiver. So this kind of uh, uh, signals are actually error because uh, sometimes satellites out of the site and send the signal and it's reflected and receive the uh, receiver. So it should be omitted. And uh, I will explain how it can be omitted uh, using this, uh, these methods. So uh, the following slides are explain the two concepts. So one is a nonlinear least square method. So other one is a Kalman filter. So the nonlinear uh, least square method is a uh, well-known one. Uh, it is usually used for the uh, solving the pseudo range calculations. So usually currently uh, everyone using a mathematical model to tracking the user locations. So this is a one. So if you see this uh, equation, so in the left side, uh, there's a pseudo range. And uh, there's how the uh, entities are uh, satellite position and clock bias and uh, speed of flight. So you, you may notice uh, uh, there are uh, four unknown entities. One is uh, uh, the user locations, uh, the based on XR and X, uh, YR, so those kind of things. And the other one is a clock bias. So if you have a four unknown uh, uh, entity, uh, you need uh, at least four observation. Uh, to solve these equations. So which means if you want to uh, locate a single location, so you need a four satellite observations at least. So the second concept is Kalman filter. So Kalman filter actually estimate the unknown quantity with the uh, known entity measurements. So uh, people using this one for the uh, optimal estimation algorithm. So let's say uh, you have an initial uh, movement. So you get a new movements. That means from the user locations. So uh, how you can integrate with the new location? So the new location maybe have an error or a, a bias. So we we give some way to the new estimations. So then and only uh, we can into, integrate to the existing one. So you can see this in the picture. So Kalman filter is uh, using a fuse the measurement and the predictions. So it's based on the uh, Kalman filter using a, a Gaussian distribution to find the uh, uncertainty of the measurement. And based on that one, uh, we allocate the, it allocate the weight to the new estimations. So uh, this uh, methodology uh, we used uh, to, to check uh, the Google Android development, uh, Google Android data set. Uh, which was open uh, 2020, 2022. So it's a part of the uh, open challenge for the mobile user tracking. So the first thing is a data pre-processing. So uh, these are the uh, in, these are the statements we are we are getting from uh, data analysis and the domain experts. So let's say you have uh, noticed that the second point, the satellite elevation degree is less than uh, 15 degree. So this kind of uh, data should be omitted. So I, I previously explained. Uh, maybe it is out of the site, out of the site, but uh, during the multipath, uh, the signal can be captured. So these kind of a things are omitted. So let's say carrier frequency error greater than a uh, 2.0 E5 uh, hertz. These kind of things are omitted. So the first thing is uh, we are using a nonlinear least square uh, uh, algorithm uh, method. So to find the uh, user position and the uncertainty of the positions. For that one, uh, we are using an objective function, initial guess, uh, Jacobian matrix, and uh, weights and the loss functions. So the, uh, you, can, you can see in the picture, the first one and second one is a uh, residual function for the position and the velocity. And the uh, third one and fourth one are uh, weights. And the uh, fifth one is a, uh, it's a four equation. That means uh, we have four uh, unknown quantity. We need, at least, we need at least four equations to solve this uh, nonlinear least square problem. So output of the nonlinear uh, least square method is uh, actually uh, uncertainty. Uncertainty, uh, that means covariance metrics and the position and the velocity. 
So these are the input to the Kalman filter. So uh, you have already uh, noticed that means uh, we have an estimation and we have a measurement. So we the measurement uh, must have some uh, uncertainty. So let's say if the measurement has a, a lots of error and bias, it has a higher uncertainty. So this should be uh, integrated into the Kalman filter uh, using the nonlinear least square problems. So this is a pathfinding. So you may notice the pathfinding is a, a continuous procedure. So you, you cannot always getting the satellite signal uh, continuously. So it's a discrete one. So how do you fill in the uh, other values? That means uh, how do you fill the other values to get the continuous path is we are using an interpolation method. And uh, for the evaluation, we are using an n-vector format. So the n-vector format is uh, uh, it's very well known because of the, it does not create a non-singular values. At the same time, it's a, a unit vector. So if you uh, if you see the Earth surveys, uh, if we get the n, n one number of uh, n unit vector, so it, it's a one to one function. It uniquely represents the uh, particular surface. So the n vector format is used for the evaluation. So this is a part of the uh, Kaggle challenge. The Kaggle uh, they already define how they evaluate the particular uh, outputs. The predictions are scored on the mean with the uh, mean of 50th and 90th percentile distance error for every phone uh, and once per second, the horizontal distance is computed between the predicted latitude and ground, ground truth latitude longitude. So this is our, uh, this is our result. So it's a, uh, we are separate as a longitude and latitude and it's a ground truth. Uh, how it uh, merged and overlapped with the prediction result. And we are getting a three meter uh, accuracy for uh, our methodology. So uh, you may notice uh, the initially or currently uh, people are using a mathematical model to uh, track the uh, user mobile user locations, but it is not sufficient. Uh, the reason is uh, there are lots of errors and bias are happening. So somehow we have to add a statistical method to uh, uh, to come to the reality. reality. So if you want to analyzing the real data set, we need to add some uh, statistical point. That means uh, we are using a Kalman filter integrated to the uh, nonlinear least square uh, method. So it gives some significant improvement. So let's say uh, if you solely using a, a non mathematical model, you can get a five meter accuracy. If you're integrating the uh, statistical model called uh, Kalman filter, so we can improve the accuracy by three meters. And uh, further, this research can be extended, uh, let's say using a IMU uh, data. So let's say gyroscope or accelerometer uh, sensor output. Uh, so it will improve our, uh, improve our results also. And uh, thank you. Thank you very much. Any questions from the audience? I have two questions again. Okay. Uh, Kalman filter is a stochastic estimator. It's a stochastic estimator. Stochastic means time varying probabilistic estimator. So, mm. signals, yes, yes, in case yes. it's fine, that's fine. Uh, uh, how, how do you guarantee that your noise distribution is Gaussian in this case? Because it requires it, it oh. assumes a Gaussian noise distribution. Yes. How do you satisfy this condition here in your application? Uh, no, it's based on the assumptions because uh, assumptions only. Yes, yeah. Because the linear also Kalman filter is uh, also it's a linear estimation. Mm -hmm. So we have assumed it's a Gaussian and linear. But it performs best when it is Gaussian. Mm -hmm. Yes. Okay. So it's assumption still yes. assumption, assumption, but you are not very much sure about the practical practicality of that one. Second one, actually, when you are comparing the results, so I would rather like to see how Kalman filter performs and how Kalman and other your weighted least squares or whatever combination of whatever performs. What mm. is the difference? What 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 difference you get over the standard Kalman filter here? Uh, so let's say standard Kalman filter. We, if you if you need to use that one, uh, we have to insert as an uncertainty also. So that kind of thing, we cannot get it. Now, how much improvement in accuracy do you get? 
how, how much improvement in accuracy in your Ah, yes. Yeah. Uh, without Kalman filter, we have a 5 meter. Uh, no, no. With Kalman alone and Kalman plus something else, have you compared? Uh, no. No. Okay. We are using mathematical model and the Kalman okay. model. Okay. Okay. Right. Thank you very much. In the absence of any other questions, let, let us appreciate the presenter's uh, presentation. Thank, Thank you very much. And I also appreciate the, the audience here waiting. Uh, for the next two presentations before lunch. Our next presentation is on this topic, a dynamic factor approach to forecasting the index of industrial production in, uh, in Sri Lanka. <clears throat> Presented by Saumya Karunadika, Rajit Munasingh and Gayan Dharmaratna of the Department of Statistics, Faculty of Science, University of Colombo. And the paper will be presented uh, by Saum, uh, Ms. Saumya. Saumya holds a bachelor's, Bachelor of Science Honours in Statistics from the Faculty of Science, University of Colombo. Uh, she was awarded the most outstanding science student for the year 2021 by the University of Columbia and was also the recipient of CR and Bhargavi Rao gold medal for the best student in statistics. Currently, she works as an analyst in the Specialized Solutions Division at Acuity Knowledge Partners. Her research interests are econometrics, biostatistics, time series analysis, and forecasting and computational statistics. May I invite Saumya to Thank you. Did you know that comparison of economic performance over time is a fundamental requirement in the economic policy making? However, the indicators that are used to measure this performance are published with a delay. This causes challenges for central banks and policymakers in setting the right economic policy. Therefore, economic forecasting offers projections that approximate economic activity. A very good afternoon to everyone present here today. So my research topic is a dynamic factor approach to forecasting the index of industrial production of Sri Lanka. Did you know that there is only one measure which tracks the nation's physical volume of production? This measure is known as the index of industrial production or more commonly as the IIP. It is a monthly indicator which measures the short-term fluctuations in the manufacturing sector of the economy over the course of a specified reference period. Now, why is it important to focus the IIP? Because it assists policymakers in evidence-based policy decisions, as it is the only measure which tracks the nation's physical volume of production. Additionally, it plays a major role in the compilation of quarterly national accounts. The most important reason is that it is published with a lag of two months between two successive releases. So this delay in publication limits the usefulness of the IIP and hence an updated forecast would be extremely useful. So there are many time series models that are available for economic forecasting. However, with the evolution of information technology, researchers have gained access to thousands of economic series just in a split second. So in order to benefit from these high dimensional, high volumes of data sets, more appropriate econometric models must be utilized. However, the most widely used time series models, such as the vector autoregressive model, can only incorporate a limited number of variables due to the issue of scarce degrees of freedom. What is this issue? It is a combination of how much information you have and how many parameters you need to estimate. So when you try to add more and more variables to your model, the precision of your estimates decreases. As a result, you cannot even trust your regression results. So how to mitigate is this issue? There are two approaches. The first and the most widely used approach is visual selection. However, your analysis will still be limited to a few chosen sets of variables, and there is an unavoidable loss of information carried out by the large data set. The second methodology utilizes principal component analysis and factor analysis techniques by incorporating all available information in the data set to build a model and make forecasts. Now, what is the best approach when it comes to econometrics? To answer that, let's have a quick look at past studies. 
In the earliest econometric studies, researchers have only utilized a few economic variables to make forecasts. As a result, the impulse response function analysis and economic policy decisions were limited to those few chosen sets of variables. Then researchers start arguing that omitting variables would lead to omission of important information as the trade cycle is a collection of many simultaneous economic co-movements. Then researchers have incorporated factors to model thousands of economic series in the United States. Different types of dynamic factor models were introduced. Researchers were fascinated by the fact that how these estimated factors of the dynamic factor models explain various aspects which drive the economy of a nation. The forecasting performance of dynamic factor models has also been argued by many researchers. Researchers argue that they tend to perform than other widely used time series models. However, all these applications were limited to developed economies such as Europe and United States. There is no literature on the applications of dynamic factor models to the Sri Lankan economy. Additionally, no published studies up to date have analyzed the IIP of Sri Lanka. So this would be an interesting application of these theories. So the key objectives of my study are, first to identify the key economic variables which influence the IIP of Sri Lanka. And the second objective is to investigate how well data rich dynamic factor-based models perform compared to widely used traditional time series models and LSTMs when forecasting the out of sample IIP of Sri Lanka. So the data for my analysis was sourced from the Central Bank of Sri Lanka and the World Bank. The model estimation was based on the sample from 2000 January to 2018 December, and finally 12 month out of sample forecast were produced for the period until 2019 December. 23 economic variables, which represent various aspects of the Sri Lankan economy were considered. First, a univariate analysis was conducted. Then the research continued to modeling and forecasting the IIP by using various traditional univariate and multivariate models, as well as LSTM methodologies. Then the research incorporated principal component analysis and dynamic factor modeling techniques to forecast the IIP. Finally, the model forecasts were evaluated. So in uh, a part of dynamic factor models, several other benchmark models were also, con uh, also considered to evaluate the performance of these models. These include classical time series models as well as machine learning models. So now let me walk you through the benchmark models considered. The first benchmark model considered was the univariate Salerno model. This was employed through the Box and Jenkins methodology. The ADF and KPSS unit root test, the HEGY test for seasonal unit roots, and the HK algorithm was performed on the training data set to identify the optimal Salerno model. The significant coefficients are denoted in this table. Then the research moved on to multivariate modeling techniques. The first multivariate model considered was the vector autoregressive model. However, as I mentioned, due to the scarce degrees of freedom affecting these vector autoregressive models, only seven variables based on the test of range of causality were selected. The information criteria were constructed from zero up to a pre-specified maximum of 12 flags in order to identify the optimal number of flags. Then a principal component vector to regressive was considered. Five principal components, which explain 41.26% of the variance, were chosen to fit the principal component vector to regressive model as a ratio of 40% is considered as a reasonable fit in the areas related to macroeconomics. Additionally, two LSTMs were also considered. The first LSTM was built through the features selected through the random forest algorithm. And the second LSTM was a principal component combined LSTM, which was built through the principal component obtained through the predictor variables. So parameters were selected through hyperparameter tuning. Now let me present more about dynamic factor models. The premise behind dynamic factor models is that dynamics of large number of time series stem from relatively a small number of factors which in turn evolve over time. The first type of dynamic factor model considered was the model proposed by Bambura and Modogno. Here we follow two broad approaches in order to identify the optimal number of factors. The first approach was a performance-based parameter selection and in the second approach we allow blocks of factors to load exclusively on pre-specified variables. In both the approaches, the expectation maximization algorithm, which can handle large number of time series, was selected for the estimation procedure. The next type of dynamic factor model considered was the factor augmented vector regressive model. 
And this was implemented through a two-step principal component approach. The variables were defined as slow moving and fast moving based on how they react to pulses shocks. So now let me present the main findings of my research. In the single estimated factor of dynamic factor model, it could be considered as a coincident index, which summarizes the economic state of Sri Lanka. Even though such indexes are computed in developed economies by utilizing dynamic factor modeling techniques, no such index is there for Sri Lanka. So this would greatly aid central banks and also investors in gaining an overall picture of Sri Lanka's economic position. In the second approach, the factor block structure was based on the central bank's economic variable classification. It was identified that the external factor is highly volatile. Also, since the exchange rates were positively loaded on this external sector factor, the sharp drop in 2009 could be attributed to the 2009 global recession. The specification of number of factors also has a considerable effect on the forecasting performance. And it was identified that usually a few factors contribute to accurate forecasts. In line with the first objective of my study, it was identified that agricultural exports, mineral exports, investment inputs, electricity power consumption, Colombo Consumer Price Index, and Gold Price have a significant impact on the IIP, and these variables must be closely monitored in the formulation of industrial policies. Now let me present the summary of forecast in line with the second objective of my study. The dynamic factor models outperform the widely used spectatorial regressive models. The LSTM models generated the best overall forecast. However, as the model interpretability is one of the primary concerns in the discipline of econometrics, dynamic factor models are much preferred. As this is the first application of dynamic factor models to the Sri Lankan economy, it is interesting to further study whether incorporating more variables would lead these models to pick up rapid switches in the Sri Lankan economy by delivering better forecast. So that brings us to the end of my presentation. Before concluding, I would like to say that data can show how to avoid drugs below the surface and how to navigate shallow waters to see and take advantages of opportunities during an economic crisis. So it is high time that Sri Lanka pays attention to these data-driven dynamic factor modeling techniques in order to confront the current economic crisis. Thank you very much for your time and attention. Thank you very much indeed, and it, it was a thorough and uh, excellent presentation. Yes. And any questions from the audience? As usual, I have two questions. Yes. First one, um, according to my little knowledge, uh, economy of a country or whatever for that matter, uh, I would like to approximate that to a control system. Say, for example, there are monetary policy decisions and other decisions, political decisions taken, for example, with regard to the exchange rate uh, or interest rate or anything else. Those decisions can also change the economic factors, the factors you have, uh, factors you have emphasized or whatever. Uh, so in, in, in such, such a situation where it is a closed control system, not only a closed control system, because those things can be affected by other countries taking decisions with regard, with regard to their policy rates and so on and so forth. Are you able to accurately predict, uh, as you have done here, if it is a, for example, a sort of a control system, so that means we take a decision and then it will change the future outcome or whatever. Because it is not something um, decisionless. What's your opinion on that? Uh, yes, sir, I agree with that. So, like in these dynamic factor models, like we can perform an impulse response function analysis to all the variables considered. So, like uh, when a shock is imposed to the system by monetary policies or like interest rates and so on, like we can uh, measure like how the uh, very how the variables will react by using this impulse response function analysis. For this specific research, I didn't conduct any impulse response function analysis, but in further studies, we can uh, do that for all the variables considered. Okay, good. Second question is actually now central bank data. Your analysis depends on past central bank data. And there are, there are some people who doubt about the validity of such data. So it's like, say, for example, I'm not blaming anyone, but uh, if you take the meteorology department, uh, some long, long time back, some academicians studied the rainfall data, whatever. 
and uh, they, this rainfall data has been collected from throughout the island. But uh, the, uh, the validity of that data has been doubted. So how do you, do you believe that this is accurate data or have, have you checked whether if the data was falsified or whatever, what would uh, that be having an effect on your outcome or whatever? Uh, so, so for, for the research through the univariate analysis, I plotted. So if there are like major deviations in those data, like I try to input considering that there is a default in that specific time series. Okay, okay. Thank you very much. And once again, uh, let us thank the speaker for, uh, uh, sorry. Yeah, you have a question, yeah. Hi, uh, so like uh, inside the presentation, uh, I just have, one question regarding the variables that you have like found out that are like very uh, sensitive to the uh, IAP. Um, so uh, I'd like to know whether those variables like are dependent on each other in terms of like influencing the IAP or like whether they are like individually uh, dependent. Like they are, the uh, thank you very much for the question. Like they're definitely like, uh, since the economy is a result of many ones, like it's definitely dependent on each other. But since in this specific research, my uh, like the, like I wanted to see how they impact the IIP, I considered like their individual impact in my research, but they're definitely like depending on each other, even the independent variables. Yeah, as in like, uh, is that your assumption or like, um, have you uh, found out from your research that like those are individually impactful to each other? Uh, yes, from my research, I found that they are independently impacting the IIP. IIP yes. Yeah. Thank, Thank you. you. Okay. Thank you very much. Thank you. Final speaker before uh, lunch break is uh, the, 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 the title for the presentation is Analyzing the Evolution of Source Code to Predict Vulnerabilities. Uh, sorry, uh, just the next one. Okay, I'm sorry. Uh, paper number 27, Singhala hate speech detection in social media using machine learning and deep learning. Presented by W.S. Sandarukhi. Okay. See me, Sandarukhi obtained a B.Sc. honors in statistics with computer science from the University of Colombo. She's presently working as an intern in machine learning at SenseMate IoT Intelligence. Let me request uh, Ms. Sandra Rukshi to deliver her paper. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, I'm Simit Fernando, and uh, my research topic is Singhala Hate Speech Detection in Social Media using uh, machine learning and deep learning. So in this presentation, I'm going through these topics. Um, nowadays, uh, the internet-based uh, communication is become the most uh, popular uh, information communication technologies in every country. Uh, 3.96 billion people use social media worldwide in 2021. Uh, and uh, 7.9 million social media users in Sri Lanka in January 2021. Um, people can use social media to freely express their thoughts and beliefs. Um, and uh, we can use uh, social media to uh, share information and update in, uh, information around the world. Uh, but there are some challenges because some people uh, use uh, social media to uh, spread uh, hateful content. 
the hasty growth of uh, this uh, hate speech in social media uh, seems to have big impact on uh, increased racism uh, psychological and sexual harassments in uh, society and uh, it's a uh, big impact on uh, goodwill of a country so uh, to tackle these uh, harmful hate reactions uh, some uh, social media companies uh, removed uh, 72% of illegal hate speech on their platforms uh, during 2018 uh, current tools uh, fail to detect uh, hate speech on uh, sri lankan post because uh, some posts were uh, in uh, singhala unicoded uh, language uh, so uh, my uh, main objective uh, on this study is to classify social media content as hate or not by using different feature engineering uh, machine learning and uh, deep learning models and to identify uh, different types of hate speech detection uh, techniques and uh, to analyze the performance of, of these tasks using different data sets um so these are the significance of this study the ability to flag racist or sexist hate speech in social media will uh, alert social media users to potential perpetrators and such an ability will also uh, empower potential victims and make uh, them feel safe online uh, let's move on to the research process um in this uh, research i have used uh, two different data sets uh, which were pre collected ones and uh, different sizes uh, then uh, did pre processing uh, feature extraction and uh, evaluate uh, classification models uh, by using accuracy and f1 score i selected uh, best three models for each data set and did hyperparameter tuning uh, then it is important to uh, use completely different data set for testing for that uh, i have collected data from uh, facebook using instant data scraper tool uh, and uh, did annotation manually by using uh, uh, majority three votes from independent raters uh, then um, evaluated those uh, test data set uh, uh, in hyperparameter tuned uh, models then uh, selected the best model for uh, detecting singhala hate speech Uh, so these are the data preprocessing parts um, I have done, and uh, first I have removed uh, non-singular characters because uh, here uh, I only concern about uh, singular unicoded characters, and then uh, removed uh, numbers and uh, punctuation marks and did tokenization and remove uh, stop words uh, which were not influenced uh, a comment being uh, heard or not. Uh, then. did uh, stemming in stemming we are uh, removing prefixes and suffixes and get the basic word uh, by doing uh, stemming we can reduce the uh, feature vector uh, dimensionality um, then uh, these are the uh, feature extraction methods uh, i have used back of words tfidf word to vect and fast test uh, then um, I have used uh, five different machine learning models and CNN, uh, RNN, LSTM deep learning models. Uh, so um, I mentioned that in a research process, I have selected six best models. So these are the performances on uh, those models, and uh, you can see that uh, multinomial naive bias support vector, uh, vector machine and random forest uh, performed uh, well in. Uh, on uh, data set 1 which has a uh, small number of observations and uh, logistic regression support vector machine and rnn models uh, performed better on uh, data set 2 which has a uh, large number of observations then did uh, hyperparameter tuning for machine learning models i have used grid search uh, for deep learning models i have used uh, keras tuner then um, these are the uh, best mo uh, six models performances on the test set uh, here you can clearly see that rnn was the best model for detecting hate speech
uh, among uh, five machine learning models and uh, three deep learning models, uh, RNN with fastest embedding uh, has the greatest AUC ROC of uh, 0.71 with 70% uh, accuracy. And um, when comparing the feature extraction methods, uh, character uh, trigram features surpass all other feature types uh, in machine learning models. Uh, then comparing uh, machine learning models and deep learning models to detect uh, hate speech uh, in uh, singular language, deep learning models outperform uh, machine learning models. So uh, in this research, uh, I have not uh, concerned about uh, which uh, community or sub uh, community or group, uh, uh, group of people, particularly uh, hate, uh, hate speech uh, targeted. Uh, that was a limitation. Um, and uh, in this uh, research, uh, I, ha I have used only supervised learning techniques. Uh, so we can uh, carry out uh, unsupervised learning techniques for uh, identify hate, single hate speeches and uh, transfer learning models such as BERT and GPT uh, can be carried out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much. Any questions for the presenter? Now, uh, when you say hate speech, uh, it's single only, no? you yeah. have done a study. So whatever that language, it, it implies meaning of a particular word in a specific context. So are you considering that as well? Because I can say some word, type or write or speak or whatever, in a different context and it may not be the same as in another context. So meaning in a particular context, context aware meaning. So does your system capture that or is it merely an analysis of certain words, whether they exist or not? Uh, it's dependent on the data set, uh, which I have trained. Uh, and we used annotated data set. Uh, so it's dependent on the annotation basically. If uh, some context uh, annotated as hate, then it will train, uh, train as hate. Okay. Okay. Thank you very much for the presentation and let's appreciate uh, the speaker's efforts. Thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so, as I mentioned to you earlier, we will now break the session for uh, lunch. And uh, I'm inviting all of you to have lunch at the rooftop. Uh, so, we'll continue the rest of the presentation after the lunch. And uh, I'm hoping all of you will be there after 30 minutes, which will be 1.50. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you.